Hello everyone, and we are back with another commentary video. This time we are going to discuss Conquest of Camelot. You know, it's it's funny because I forget how beautiful this game really is. Because unlike um, like Lee Shoot Larry and Police Quest and Quest for Glory, um, all of those... Um, the copy protection doesn't rely too much on having a manual on most of those even uh, at the beginning where you know it says hey what tell me the word on page seven third paragraph you know you know six sentence over whatever it might be even those are removed in current releases of collections so unfortunately, things like Conquest of Camelot and uh, Conquest of Longbow never got a collection where the potential of moving some of the copyright could be done. Uh, and not copyright, but copyright protection, I should say. But to be honest, I'm not sure how they would do it for Conquest of Camelot because it did rely on uh, having the manual and looking up, like for example, there's a part in the book, uh, part of the game where you need to know what specific flowers mean as well as there's a part of the game you need to know what the different uh, embodiments I guess you could say a goddess means and so those were written in the book so it required having that book and needing to take that out when you reach these parts of the game so I'm not sure how that could have actually probably been removed um, without recoding the game entirely like having it somewhere in the game that you can go into the help screen and say oh these are what the flowers mean or something like that so that wasn't going to happen so i feel like <laughs> because of that i have not played conquest of camelot uh, on repeat as often as i would probably have liked um having bought it originally i know i've played it a few times I even, uh, in my uh, Conquest of Camelot book, uh, oftentimes when I originally got these games, I'd keep all my notes in the game, and uh, I actually found a note <laughs> that was in that box uh, from when I originally beat it. Let me find... I, so if you go to forums.sierrahelp.com, it's one of the forums that I co-admin. Um, it is actually Collector who runs the site and runs the forum, but I actually co-admin over there. And so oftentimes when I do a playthrough and stuff like that, or if I find cool stuff inside my manuals, like I found several of my manuals that have like the receipts that when I originally bought the game. So like I have the receipt for like King's Quest 4 and how the game cost me $54 even back then, which is kind of crazy to think that the game was $54 then. And, it, you know, games are still relatively that much in price. So if you really think of how much everything else in the world since, you know, like the 80s has gone up in cost, these games cost so much money back then. So it's kind of wild. Um, let me see if I can find that post real quick. Sorry, you know, I should have probably had this already set and ready. All right, here we go. Just found it. Um, so I have a note here uh, that that I scanned and posted on the forum. Uh, the note is even from my then friend, uh, my friend Sean Quorum. Uh, it's his father's uh, notary thing because it says from the desk of Mike Quorum. And it says my score skill back then was 306 over 368 my wisdom was 254 over or 293 and my soul was 350 over 3 358 and i have little notes of w e s e s n which at the you know when i was looking at this in my box i couldn't remember what that was for but it becomes very clear later on near the end of the game but there's a note written in light blue that says solved 303 a.m on 11 13 1990 so it's kind of cool to have these little things in my uh in my box that i kept like the receipts and these little notes and i have like maps that i hand drew and stuff like that and in this one you can kind of see a map faded on the background which is on the other side of the piece of paper um 
for some I have the din dirt and false so that's the coins but I also in orange I have 89% B plus and I don't I don't know what that's for I don't know if I did some average of the scores and that's uh, that is what I got like 89% of all the scores I don't know I don't know what the 89% B plus is so I have no idea uh, but at any rate um, the <laughs> the conquest of Camelot the, this game is freaking beautiful and the music is so good um, that now like most games that even though I own it anytime it comes out somewhere else like on Steam or GOG I'll purchase it there just to you know show support that I love adventure games and not only that is often when you purchase it on GOG you'll get the manuals in PDF so now that makes it much easier for me to replay the game when I want to because now I don't have to go into my garage into the plastic bin I have like eight bins of CR games so I need to find out which ones they are most of them are labeled on the front like this is my King's Quest bin this is my Space Quest bin um, but some of the games that only had like one or two like Lorabo, Phantasmagoria all of those are kind of shoved into three different bins that just say CR games <laughs> so um, it with GOG I can just get the PDF now and I'll have that at the ready and you know makes it much easier to play these types of games if you purchase them on GOG because then you get that PDF and you don't have to go f dig up the manual if, if the game requires a manual and so uh, all of that said um, the game is beautiful it's very very well done there's only one there's truly only one part in the game that um, that I got a little frustrated about and uh, you, you'll see it when I get to it and uh, so there is there's just one part that I thought they kind of overdid this and I'll, I'll talk more to that uh, later if you watched or if you even follow my channel which I assume you do if you somehow landed here uh, you'll see that I posted two versions of my Conquest of Camelot playthrough there is one that is much longer than the other. Uh, it's almost six hours, and this is the one I'm commenting on, is this six-hour version. But by the time I'm done, because any portion where I don't talk, I speed up the video uh, rather than having a commentary that has big bridges of silence. I just speed it up so each, each part where I'm talking gets to it much quicker. Uh, so this won't be six hours, I promise you. Unless I somehow do manage to ramble for six hours, which I highly doubt. It is possible, but I highly doubt I'll do it, I promise. But there is a second version of this video that is shorter that says Dead End Removed. Um, it is possible to dead end very early in this game, as I discovered. So as a king, uh, you'll see that... Um, <laughs> I just save the game as, it's just a model. That's a Monty Python reference if you wondered why I saved the game under that name. Anyway, as the king, you would think that you have unlimited ri riches, right? That you could have as much gold and coin as you want. And so when you go and get your gold coins, or not just gold, you get copper, silver, and gold, uh, you get more copper, medium amount of silver, and then very few gold. And... Um, being this king, I, I just thought, came upon a hunter who was down on his luck, just trying to feed his family, so I was being generous and gave him some coin, and he thanks me and all this other stuff, so I thought, oh, you know, that's probably going to add to my soul points, right, because, you know, I'm showing I'm kind and generous, but later on, you'll need to book a passage, and you will not have enough money if you're kind and generous as I was. And you cannot, once you leave Camelot, you cannot leave. And so I did, I'm fairly far into the game, I ended up at a dead end. And uh, that dead end happened because something I did earlier, which, which was meeting the hunter, which is very, very soon in the game. It's literally just after I left the castle. And um, so I basically cropped that part out and I, was going to try to just restore from some point, but I realized, you know, I did it so soon in the game, I'm just going to restart entirely. And what was interesting is when I restarted, I found something out that 
I don't think I've ever done in my other playthroughs of Conquest Camelot. Now again, I've not played this as often as, you know, Leech Suit Larry, King's Quest, Police Quest, Quest for Glory, Phantasmagoria even. Um, but I learned something that, so for example, one of the things you'll have to do, and you'll see it shortly, is um, you have to go kneel and pray to um, these two gods, basically, and you get a vision, which is beneficial, kind of helps you out to know what to do. Um, but in order to get this vision, you need to donate coin. So it, when I went back and replayed, and I had already known, you know what, I dead-ended once because I did not have coin. And once you leave Camelot, they don't let you back in because you're on a quest and, you know, king, you can't come back. I know you're the king, but you can't come back in here. Um, after I donated to these two um, areas where I kneeled and prayed and got these visions, I said, you know what? Because both of those cost me money, I'm going to go back to my treasury and tell my guy to give me more money. And he says, well, I can't give you more money um, unless you want to give me your purse back and then we'll dump the money out and I'll restock your gold. And I was like, huh. So I gave him the purse, he dumps the coin, so now I'm at zero. And then you just tell him, give me gold, give me copper, give me silver. And he restocks everything back to full. So you have exactly the same amount of coin that you had before you kneeled and prayed to those two places and I thought ah all right so when I got to the hunter later I was not unfortunately as generous as I was with the first play first playthrough where I was just like sure here's some money have at it go feed your family and be well um, the game punishes you for kindness it would seem um, but one thing that I really like since I'm on this screen right now that I want to talk about really quick is this game truly shows a love triangle between King Arthur, his queen that we see here, and Lancelot. She actually loves Lancelot and it talks about how he knows this. But Lancelot is such a good friend to him that he would never do anything to Lancelot so he just kind of suffers in silence. And to me, back then, you know, it just didn't dawn on me too much. But thinking about it now, after I, I replayed it again, I thought, I mean, they don't do too much. They allude to it, and you see it in a few scenes, especially near the end, um, that there is clearly something there between the three and how they all kind of stand. I thought for a Sierra game, that was, not, I, I don't want to say risky. But it was very different to show that, you know, the main character is in love with his queen. Usually it's just, you know, the king loves the queen, the queen loves the king, everyone's happy and merry. But this showed a different scene. This showed that she loved another. And that, you know, she was with the king because it was good for the kingdom and stuff like that. But her heart was elsewhere. And I think that was pretty deep for a Sierra game back then to uh, make that move. You know and be that bold to give that kind of direction to a game and by the way if you haven't already click a like and subscribe every once in a while over to the left you'll see that like and subscribe thing kind of float up and I've kind of made uh, just something I do on the commentary I keep trying to do something fun with these rather than just me keep talking and usually when I see that thing float to the left about the like and subscribe I shoved them randomly, so they've already been injected into the video, and I'm now commenting on the video post-edit. Um, so when they try to come up, I try to look at what the scene is and try to come up with something funny that relates to the scene when the like and subscribe thing comes up. So here I am at the treasury getting my money, and I do remember when I first played this, there was something to do here that was a Monty Python reference. And I was trying to remember what it was. I was trying to, I, I knew it was like something to do with ham or Monty Python or something like that or spam a lot. And so what I ended up doing, I do end up, uh, I should say before I talk about that real quick. Um, when I play these, um, I'm playing them without looking online or looking at a walkthrough. So this is why you'll see when I get to a certain part that I said they, they could have shortened this. Uh, you see me die, I am not kidding, probably about 40 times, <laughs> because I'm not looking at a walkthrough. But I do end up 
for this instance to trigger the Monty Python thing that I know is here, as I say here, I'm gonna look it up, the Easter egg. I do. I did look up the Easter egg, so I just literally Googled Comcast Quimla, um Monty Python Easter egg, and I found the command that you have to say. When you do that, the music kicks in, it does the spam a lot thing, and it does a nod to Monty Python, uh, Quest for the Holy Grail. And which is funny, because in the beginning of my first save game was, it's just a model, and that is also a reference to Monty Python. And there you see, in memory of Graham Chapman, who was part of the Monty Python. Now one thing someone posted in the comments of one of one of the two videos that I posted for Conquest Camelot, and that I too also wonder about, is I do wonder why they did the castle overview in this way, rather than the traditional, you know, the, the 3D screens like this that you would normally see. I don't understand why they did a castle overview because what's funny is in the first playthrough it took me a very long time to find where Merlin was because I thought I was in the treasury but that's not where I'm at it's actually if you go up further there's another area that's Merlin's area so it took me a long time to uh, actually locate where Merlin was and had they done more of this this kind of view 3d kind of view where you're going through a hallway and moving into rooms that would have been much easier visually to understand where all the locations are and I think that would have been actually cooler because then the player would have been like if they wanted to um, would have mapped out the castle versus having this overview that we see here so I'm literally walking around because I know we have to talk to Merlin before we leave but I could not so when you go in here it says here's the treasury and then you notice in the treasury when you go to that screen he walks upstairs so I thought that upper circle was the treasury area that those those are the stairs up above where Merlin was because where why would Merlin why would Merlin's tower be above the treasury why would he not have his own section of a tower that seems very odd so I'm literally at this point completely lost knowing I need to talk to Merlin and I can't find him so if you need to find Merlin or if you had a hard time finding Merlin click like and subscribe and King Arthur will show you the way eventually anyway he'll eventually show you the way And as you can see, you literally start with 5 gold coins, 10 silver, and 15 copper. And this system was also kind of weird because I'm trying to figure out. So I thought, oh, you have to show how much you're going to give. So I narrow it down to 1 gold and I take everything else away. That's actually incorrect. You just need to hit enter once and that's how much he gives. So that is probably something else they could have probably made a little easier in terms of how much to give and how that works. Because for me, I thought I had to clear out everything else and show exactly how much I was giving. So I'm curious, did anyone else, when you played Conquest Camelot, did you also go the same way? Did you already know how to how the purse worked immediately. Um, to be fair, I didn't read the manual uh, when I replayed this again, uh, whatever, like a couple weeks ago. So now you can see I only have one gold because I've already given away everything else to the other one. Now, to be fair, at this point, I could have just gone back up after doing this and, <laughs> and got more coins had I known but that, I didn't figure that out until my second playthrough. So now I'm super confused because <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I thought I had to do what I did mention earlier where you have to give away everything. So it's just something to keep in mind that I thought could have been 
better. But you'll see that by giving the gold to the side of the cross, you basically get the vision of the grail. If you give the coin to the other side, you get the vision of three of your knights who went in search of the grail and now find themselves in terrible danger. And all three of them are in desperate need of being saved by you. Also, I feel like look coins or, or look pouch should open your coin pouch, not just show you the pouch so that you can see how much coin you have. That was another thing to understand how much gold you have. I mean, it's probably a way to do it somewhere in the. But now you can see I've zero. I, I've given everything away. So as you can see, I didn't, because in this playthrough I didn't know you could actually go back up and ask for more coin. Um, I ended up restoring. <laughs> See if we can figure out this uh, prayer thing correctly. I also feel that if you specified how much you want to give, like when I typed give one gold coin, it should already know that's what I'm doing rather than prompting me with the purse to do it. And so in order to give the amount of money, you actually just need to click enter on that amount. So if you want to give one gold, you don't actually clear everything else. You just hit enter once. But to me, when I read it, if so, when it has five gold and whatever 15 silver and whatever 10 or 10 silver and 15 copper if you hit enter once it looks like to me you're going to give four gold 10 silver 15 copper because at the very bottom it says give so it looks to me that's the total you're giving but maybe that's maybe that's just me again if that's how when you played that's how you also read it the first time you played let me know in the comments or uh if it says it somewhere in the manual, I probably should read the manual before I play these games, but I like going in kind of blind uh, because I've played these games so so long ago and I liked replaying them and basically seeing what I could remember, what my thoughts were brand new without having to be reminded of anything in the manual. So, because a lot of, I mean, these days, who reads manuals anymore? If you buy something new, you throw the manual to the side and you just start putting it together. Unless it's from Ikea. If it's Ikea, you need the manual because those things are a mystery to try to put together without the manual. And sometimes even with the manual, when you use the manual at Ikea, you still somehow put a piece in backwards. Or is that just me? And I've yet to find Merlin's place, just to point that out. <laughs> So clearly, Merlin's is not that way, because that's a closed gate, and you can't leave until you mount the horse and all that stuff. Saving it has did it right this time, because I actually did the coins correctly this time. But, still need to find frickin' Merlin. I wasn't sure if Merlin would appear after you do something, like it requires like triggering an event, like do you have to pray before Merlin shows up somewhere? And then it says you are at the treasury, and then I finally clicked up. You are granted possession of this small tower where only the brave dare tread, and guess whose tower it is. So if you were able to find Merlin's tower very easily, click like and subscribe and let me know 
how you piece together that Merlin was above the treasury and how that makes any sense at all. Because I'd love to hear it. <laughs> this is no mere man. I am Merlin. And so throughout the game, uh, Merlin does help you. Um, you'll often get dialogue that is showing that it's coming from Merlin. And it even says right there, I'll guide you and advise you as I am able. And he even warns you there, choose carefully, because once you leave Camelot, you can't come back. Which means if you're kind and generous to a hunter, uh, you ain't coming back. And so this map has several locations. Um, I did like that they dumped some history in here about the various locations or some of it lore and stuff like that. Um, but when you get to your map, all these areas are there. It's a very similar map. Um, but you can only travel to some of them, which is kind of cool. Um, I like that they didn't just show you where you can travel and this is a note about that area i like that they showed other areas included like either history or lore and history and lore about those areas so it clearly shows that they put their time and effort and really cared about making this game feel authentic and really pull you into the role of king arthur So as you can see, there is a lot of lore on that map, so I just sped through it rather than comment on that stuff. You can, at your leisure, uh, if you play this game, read it. Or um, if you watch my other playthroughs, it goes through much slower and you can actually read which e what each of those areas says. Oh, and I think, so I'm looking at the, uh, at the typing where the letters are doubling up. So, a little story about that. So, my computer had, no longer has, but had a Bluetooth keyboard and, you know, Bluetooth mouse and all that stuff. And just recently I had upgraded my internet. Um, turned out, like, my internet was like all messed up in the wiring and stuff like that so they had to redig my whole yard and run a whole new line through and in the process they got rid of my modem which is fine because uh, we've had that modem probably for like 12 years and so you can see the letters doubling up like that just again like when I was typing lodestone so we'd had it for like 12 years and so the guy was like hey I can I can replace it for free you know I can give you a different modem if you want and we're like sure 
And he did say like, you know, the new modem that we have though doesn't have like Wi-Fi. So you're gonna have to buy a router. And I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I can buy like a, uh, a new router, probably need one anyway, probably be stronger than what the modem would push out. So I brought a, bought a brand new fancy router, a uh, good old Linksys router. And uh, as it would turn out, the way the Linksys router broadcasts was because it's so close to my computer it's literally like two feet away from me it was actually interfering with bluetooth and so i tried a few times to broadcast on different signals through the router and it was not fixing it so what i ended up doing because it was driving me crazy i could not figure out what it was it wasn't just happening in sierra games like if i was typing in word it would same thing would happen it would randomly produce all these extra letters or have a delay and I could not figure out what it was and I realized the only thing that had changed was when I got the router so when I first got the modem it didn't no issues uh, and I didn't get the router for like I think three days after we got the modem and that's when the issue started surfacing so I narrowed it down to I think it's the router and um, definitely didn't seem like the, key, uh, the keyboard had any issues because if I hooked up the Bluetooth to my, uh, my iPad that's like three rooms away, it had no issues. It would type normal, no extra letters or anything like that. So it wasn't like the Bluetooth battery was dying in the keyboard, uh, which would have been odd because it was a fairly new keyboard and new batteries in it anyway. So I was like, okay, I'm confident it's not the keyboard. So definitely the router broadcasting. So I plugged in a um, just, you know regular USB keyboard uh, and it got rid of the typing issue. Now, I think it's throughout this game you might see the letters duplicate like that. I don't think I did the keyboard fix until like way later. So if you if you wonder why I'm typing and suddenly there's like 16 extra letters, it would be because the at the time I was using a Bluetooth keyboard and the router was apparently interfering with the broadcasting of that Bluetooth. Answer about I seek the answer to life, universe, and everything. That is a reference to Hitchhiker's Guide, which is why I typed the number 42. Um, if you've read Hitchhiker's Guide, or if I think they do it in the movie, I've never seen the Hitchhiker's Guide movie. Um, but if you've read the book, you know it. And if you've ever played the original text adventure game of Hitchhiker's Guide, that game is brutal. Um, Oh, the thing brings me nightmares. All right, so we've talked to Merlin. We're pretty much good to go now. So we've done the prayer. We've talked to Merlin. We've gotten some items. We're ready to go. Let's let's go on our quest to save our companions. Now the reason I circled back is because it seems like the mule is not following. <laughs> Follow me, mule. Alright, so if you are ever on a quest uh, in your own life, tell me about it in the comments down below. Alright, so we're here and we're gonna... We're off to save our first companion and find out more about where we need to go uh, in order to find a grail. It's not going to be really easy. I 
And if you remember uh, when we kneeled and prayed before the two things, we got clues as to where our companions are and their state of distress. So the first place we're going to head for is the forest and a Widdershin appears saying copper tin, copper tin, and we know we have copper. Um, and you need to give him copper or else it will end the game for you. So whether coming into the forest or leaving the forest, you need to give him copper. So we gave him a copper, and now we're able to proceed forward. And by proceed forward, I mean go to the left. And here is the hunter where I originally gave just a little bit too much coin due to my generosity which would eventually dead-end me later. So when you ask about his family, he says he's poor and he has five children to feed. So, if you were playing the game and you too were a generous king uh, who gave too much coin, let me know in the comments uh, how you felt when you reached the dead end, because you were too generous. And if you haven't already, naturally, um, please do click like and subscribe. It does really help the channel. Um, my end goal is to try to get to a thousand subscribers, because once you reach a thousand subscribers, you can actually try to monetize what you have. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't, because currently I'm at, I think I'm almost at 900, so I'm almost there. Um, but because I only have a thousand subscribers, I'm not obviously a popular YouTube channel that has like millions of subscribers. So I would not make a lot of money, but honestly, any, any amount of money would help. Um, uh, back in 2020, my wife had some medical issues and she is no longer able to work. So income is solely coming from me and so any amount of uh, revenue I can generate is always appreciated um, like I have uh, there's a, a thing called DMs Guild I do write some stuff for D&D I love D&D Dungeons and Dragons and so I've uh, put up a few things on there like every month I might make like sometimes 20-30 bucks which isn't much but I mean that puts gas in the tank and lets me get to and from work because thankfully work is fairly close I don't even have to touch a freeway to get to work um, but that's you know that type of stuff though trivial in amount is still beneficial in some way you know any any amount of money helps I uh, what's funny is at work uh, so the drinking soda is free so cans of soda free ironically you have to pay for water not not for water like uh, you know out of a faucet but the water bottles actually cost money but soda is free so what I do is I do drink a lot of Coke Zero. I've talked about it in my other channels that I drink a lot of Coke Zero. And uh, I take those cans and bring them home and then like once a month, take it to the recycling center and usually try to rake in about anywhere from 40 to like 60 bucks, depending on how many cans I have. So, you know, trying to reach that thousand mark for subscribers just so I can see if I can try to monetize even the YouTube channel. Because I love, I mean, as I said, I have bins of my Sierra games from when they originally came out. Um, 
Sierra, and then Surtech, which made like the Wizardry games and uh, Realms of Arcania. And there's a few others that I kept, but I have a, you know, back in the day I had a ton of computer games that I just never kept. But there were certain ones that stuck with me, like Sierra for sure stuck with me. I even, with my father and my mother, and at the time one of our dogs, drove up way back in the day to even apply at Sierra to try to get in, get in at their customer service. And my dream was once I got in that, you know, got my foot in the door with their customer service, I could, you know, show that I could do game design because I had all these ideas. Um, so, like, I was truly interested in Sierra. And then Surtech was just a great game because Wizardry was sort of a doorway to D&D &D in terms of how it was with different races and the magic and stuff like that and that's the same thing for realms of arcania realms of arcania the three original ones that came out by surtech um had a heavy influence in the D, &D world that i created that i still run to this day i run like five or six D, &D games now and all the campaigns are tied together so what happens in one campaign may uh affect another campaign and stuff like that so it's kind of a living world feel to it so it's kind of cool anyway we're not here to talk about DD and all that stuff literally what i'm try just trying to say uh if you click like and subscribe if you have not already it'd be greatly appreciated because that gets me closer to my 1000 subscriber goal than i am trying to reach um and if you enjoy these videos not so much the rambling i just did a moment ago but if you enjoy the videos, whether it's just watching Sierra games and stuff like that, uh, definitely it helps. Word of mouth is incredible. So if you are on social media or anything like that and want to say, hey, check out this guy's YouTube channel, by all means, go ahead and do it. I give you permission. Uh, <laughs> I greatly appreciate it. Um, so yeah. Anyway, back to um, Conquest of Camelot. So as you can see, even though we were still in the forest, it accidentally went out onto this screen, and uh, we got vexed. But as you can see, the mule has escaped. So the mule refused to go forward because there was boars up ahead. Now this is... This is one of the one of the small trivial parts that I disliked about this game is um, there are boars that come out here, three of them, uh, pretty much in a row as you move forward, and you'll see it here. The timing is very difficult because you just basically hit the spacebar to thrust the spear. So lucky shot, got him on the first one. The second one comes out there's less distance between you and the boar so timing is more difficult got the second one third one comes out and it's at a different angle and the thing is during this boar scene you can see i got dismounted and killed during this boar scene you cannot save uh the ability to save is uh turned off so it makes it tedious to do the boar thing because normally you would just kill the first boar, save, go to the second boar. If you kill it, save. If not, restore. That we just have to do the second boar again. One of my complaints of Codename Iceman, which I, I love that game. I, I know it gets a lot of slack. Um, there are parts of it that I truly hate in Codename Iceman. Uh, the subsequence um, diving to a certain depth to avoid missiles, the randomness of the missiles missing, um, but at least during the missile combat you can save. However, there is a portion in that game where you're gambling for a bottle against the guy in the sub and saving and restoring this is not disabled, but you can only do it so many times before the guy says you're a cheater and leaves. This is just punishing the player who is just trying to enjoy the game and trying to make it through. Uh, imagine if you were playing Lucid Larry and you're playing 
at the ta you know at the gambling table to try to get the money that you have to get and you can only save and restore so many times before like someone in the casino would throw you out for cheating that type of punishment towards a player i think is unnecessary so disabling the ability to save when you have three literally arcade sequences in a row to do is something that i've never been a fan of in the sierra game so the boar fight i'm not a fan of but there is something that 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 is even worse than this boar fight and uh it's coming up soon so i'll save to talk about that when we get to it but yeah the disabling of the save game during any kind of arcade sequence during sierra games is something that was not necessary i get they're trying to make it so that the game lasts longer because if you could just save and restore very easily during the arcade sequences there's not a lot of risk to it but at the same time sierra games are not arcade games in terms of these adventure games they're adventure games they're a story that you're trying to go through and learn I mean, if you want an arcade game, just go to the arcade and play, like, Donkey Kong. You know what I mean? Don't expect to save and restore there, because that's it's an arcade game. But Sierra games were adventure games that should not have disabled or punished uh, anyone from trying to save or restore. That's my two cents, and uh, if you disagree, I'd love to hear why in the comments. But I would be surprised if anyone who played Sierra games would disagree with me, because... A lot of times what people prefer Lucas Games over Sierra Games for is the lack of death. Lucas Games was not as punishing, and also Lucas Games didn't really have dead ends. Which, as I said, in this game you can technically dead end if you are too generous with your coin. So, as I said, there are three boar fights here. And uh, it's not much to talk about. Again, I already just talked about it with the save and disabling the ability to save here, so I'll just be quiet and speed through the boar fight. As you can see in that one, I didn't even make it past the first boar. I know I said I would shut up just so that we could get through it, but that's what I mean. It's so utterly random. Sorry about the bun. The pun about this is going to be boring. Yeah. This sequence is probably one of the se one of the reasons why people don't speed run this game. But again, this isn't the worst part of this game. There's another part that for sure is the reason why probably no one has ever, to my knowledge, done a speed run version on Conquest, Conquest of Camelot. And I know I keep saying I'll shut up just so we can speed through it, but just the fact that how tedious because you can't save this part is can't get over it So after several tries, you can see that I put the arcade sequence down to easy. It didn't matter. Second boar got me. 
then I put the game into slow, as slow as the game will go, and the first war still got me. Because it's not clear when you're supposed to thrust the spear. So if you happen to know at what point when the boar is in front of you that you're supposed to thrust the spear, I mean I eventually did it, but it was all random. As you can see by the multiple times I've died here. So if you know actually when you're supposed to thrust that spear, let me know in the comments. I'd love to know. One of the things that I talked about in one of my other videos is once I'm kind of done playing uh, a bunch of games, uh, mostly I've been focusing on Sierra, but there have been other games that I've played, like I played um, Legend of Karandia, which is not a Sierra game. It's from Westwood Studios. Uh, I also played um, Blue Force, which was made by Jim Walls from Police Quest, um, but technically it was a Tsunami game. Uh, so I do plan to play other games in, in this channel uh, that should be or sort of related to adventure-esque games, games from that same era and stuff like that. Like I'll probably play probably at least the first less manly I don't know if I'll play the second one I probably will play the second one because I've, I've beaten it before but I don't like the second game as much as I like the first one for less manly even the first one was pretty far out there it was clear that they were trying to capitalize on like a leash suit Larry esque type game but made it very weird <laughs> but something that i do plan on probably doing because <clears throat> I, as i said i don't really look at uh, walkthroughs before i play these games or during the, the time i'm playing so when i'm kind of done doing that just playing these games willy-nilly without walkthroughs and stuff like that um something i'm thinking about doing is also creating like video walkthroughs for the game so you know look at a walkthrough and make you know make the steps that you need to get, you know, like a maximum score or whatever. So that, you know, I can make some useful videos, not just some of me playing. So I don't know how popular walkthrough videos are these days because I don't feel like too many people play uh, these games these days. A lot of people like to talk about them. I'm in several Facebook, sorry, Facebook groups that talk about these games, but I don't see a lot of people playing them these days. So. I don't know how popular that'll be, but it's just something to do to keep creating content on this channel. So we have finally beat the boar. Uh, this guy has a, a blue sleeve that is on the skeleton. And it's a lady sleeve, so that kind of gives you a clue. As you can see, when I save my games, quite frequently I like to use puns, like saying this is going to be a long night, because the skeleton in front of me appears to have been a knight. Alright, so it's the Black Knight, and he is going to give us an offer that we can save our companion, but in order to do so we have to joust him, or we can just turn away, our companion dies. And we hope for the best. Obviously, we're not going to let our companion die. We're going to have to joust him. Now, this took a few tries because it's yet another arcade sequence in terms of jousting the Black Knight. But after a few tries, something that I noticed is if you tend to raise your shield slightly, but then when you joust, raise your joust to the upper, I guess you could say upper left corner slightly, You'll see when I start doing it, and aim for the Black Knight's, um, it would be his right shoulder because you're jousting opposite side. Uh, if you aim for his right shoulder, you'll be able to dismount him quite frequently. And I'll admit the first time I did this, uh, because if you look at the background around you, it doesn't look like you're moving. It looks like the Black Knight is coming towards you, but it does not look like you're moving forward. So the first couple of times I was actually trying to make my horse move and you can just see me moving the joust around like why is it my horse moving he's just staying here. Um, 
So it took a bit, and then I kind of realized, okay, I'm moving the joust. The horse is probably moving this just how they're doing the arcade sequence. And while it looks good there, he'll end up uh, dismounting me quite a few times, I believe, in a row before I can actually dismount him. And you can see I'm moving the joust towards the shield as if I'm trying to hit him, but I noticed right there that hitting that corner, I was able to dismount him a second time. keeps the shield in the same area so he kind of leaves his right shoulder frequently exposed. So there we go. That'd be the third time he dismounted me. But I've kind of got a feel of what I'm supposed to do now. You know, at this point now I understand the horse is moving. I don't need to try to move forward to make the horse move. Um, and I realize that going for his right shoulder seems to be the key. So he's already on horse man. You can see the command for your shield over on the left side, which at first when I was playing this, I thought that was a black knight. Even though it has my shield, it was on his side. So I'm trying to find where that right arm is located. There I go. It's three times off the horse. Off to a bad start with one off the horse. <laughs> Two off the horse. <laughs> So you can see at times he does shift all the way over, so that covered his right shoulder. But I hit it that time, but it didn't knock him off. So there you go. There's his right shoulder. And see, he covered his right shoulder that time, but mostly he's got that right shoulder exposed. So there's his right shoulder again. Didn't get over in time to knock off that right shoulder. And you can't position it always right at the right shoulder because if you do, and that one was bullcrap. So I dismounted him and he dismounted me and we, we were both at two off of our horse. So that should have technically been a draw. So once again, move it to the right just as he approaches and horses him a second time, move it, and then third time. So that seems to be the trick is you kind of keep it a little bit to your right. As, as he gets close, pull it to the left so you're striking his right shoulder and that seems to dis dismount him most times. 
that was the formula that I found. Like again, sometimes he does move all the way to his right, so he's kind of covering it. But I found mostly he was not doing that, especially if you had your um, lance over to your right, his left, because it would look like you're gunning for that. And then change the direction last moment to strike him in the right shoulder. And we have found our companion, so that's a good sign. think having defeated the black knight and the agreement was if we beat him we could just free him but apparently the shackles are too tight so we need to use the sword to break the shackle and so when we talk to him he warns us about the monk um, and about how he believes the monk has the grail Obviously, that's not going to be the case because we have two more companions to save and we are barely into the game. So, the monk of Glastonbury. And so we throw our companion. Sorry, sorry if that was a loud bang. I just bumped my knee against the mic. So we throw our companion onto the horse, and the horse will take him back to Camelot. So now I've lost my horse and my mule. Because if you recall, the mule ran away um, in the woods before we went jousting for the boar. And so a clue for me here is the fact that the hag has blue skin and if you look at our inventory we do not have much in the way of inventory and she says you will not pass through this circle unless you give me what i want and so if we look at our inventory we have three things i think we have a purse a rose and the blue sleeve that we just took off the deceased knight oh sorry we have a lodestone and so the blue sleeve, blue skin, hagged, that was my thought, because the rose was used for guiding, the lodestone is used for guiding, so naturally, we're going to save first before we give anything to the hag in case she takes it, or in case she kills us. So you can see my rationale right there, and that's even how I save the game. She says, bring it to me, it's what I desire. So we're going to move forward, trust her to be an honest type hag. And lo and behold, she is actually Lady Elaine, transformed into a force which by the hideous spell cast upon me by the Black Knight. And it's unfortunate because she says, only the sleeve which I gave my true love could set me free. And which means her true love is the knight we saw back there. My beloved knight cannot be far away. I must find him at once. Fare thee well. Well, she is going to find a dead knight. So that will be tragic for Lady Elaine. And then as she departs, the runes on the uh, altar reveal themselves. So there is a message here to be read.
and the other three stone figures kind of around the altar. I assume those are supposed to be uh, others who tried to pass through here and were cursed by her and turned to stone. So if you read it, it says, Five poets bold did come astray. Five standing stones now bar the way. Of limbs bereft, yet voices I left. To pass through the middle, you must ask for... By the way, I think the last word is riddle. And a lot of this stuff, as I'm playing for all of that, I was writing it down for, like, clues and stuff. So I have a... Uh, I have a piece of paper with a bunch of clues as I'm playing. And look at that. There's five stones, and there's my mule. If you look at them, they look quite plain. This is where the riddles are. And that's why I was saying I think that I'm pretty sure that last word is a riddle. So I'm writing it down, trying to figure out what it is. If a man carried my burden, he would break his back. I am not rich, but leave silver in my track. What am I? And so that was the first riddle that I kind of wrote down, was trying to think it through. I couldn't figure out what that riddle was, so you'll see I'll move to the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and I'll get those pretty easily, because those are much easier than that one. So in hindsight, I'll, I'll let you know now, before I figure out what it is. It's essentially a snail. If, the, if a man were to carry my burden on his back because a snail carries her home on their back no man can carry their house on the back and the trail of silver that they leave behind is not actually like physical silver which is how I was initially interpreting it but like the slimy silver trail that they leave so to unravel me you need a simple key no key that was made by a locksmith's hand but a key that only will, I will understand what am I I, um, I've always enjoyed, uh, like, you know, riddles like this. I, I think part of that is because, um, way back in the fourth grade, my teacher read The Hobbit to the class, and that changed me forever. Um, I became so infatuated with that book that I checked it out for two years straight, read it back and forth, upside down. You know every way possible I would take my favorite pages and rewrite them to try to capture what Tolkien had written and then I would rewrite them in my own words to try to write like Tolkien and part of what was in The Hobbit is the exchange of riddles between Gollum and Bilbo so I've kind of always been into riddles since the fourth grade because I just thought that was such an interesting aspect that these two had of wits of these random tiny clues of what I am and you know you have to figure it out so much so that um, in the previously mentioned 
forums.sierrahelp.com that I co-admin, there is a game, uh, it's, a, it's a thread game on there, that says three clues what am I, and the way the game works is you take something that is in a Sierra game and you give clues about what it is and so in the clues you have to it has to be at least three things in your clues your clues can be you know like six six lines long as long as you're giving three clues as to what you are uh, for example the most recent one i did in there was something like i'm torn and tattered worn and battered i was once used by everyone but stopped once all this had begun um uh, what was the last line to find out who I am or what I something something to the degree of find out who I am you'll see uh, once you figure out what I am to be and it's um, so you ask clues and you can only answer yes or no so someone would say are you in a game that has quest somewhere in the title such as King's Quest, Police Quest, Conquest of Camelot and you know you say yes or no as the person who gave the riddle and I said no and so they eventually narrowed it down to Manhunter, and then Manhunter 2, and then they said, hey, are you the, the Golden Gate Bridge? That's in the intro of Manhunter 2, because at the very bottom it says Manhunter 2, San Francisco. And that was part of the clues, revealing who I am. The torn and tattered is because the bridge is all torn to pieces, and that I was used by everyone, now it's no one because the bridge is all broken apart, no one can use it. So well, there's a whole thread on the uh, forums.sierrahelp.com page that is literally all about riddles and riddles that we are creating based off what we're trying to show off in the game and the thing is the object has to be something that is fairly obvious so like let's just say in this screen I couldn't pick like the two rocks in the lower left corner because that's not it's not something that's common enough to know um, it would have to be like the thing on the well here or the tree over to the right because that tree is fairly unique or you know anything that is something that stands out so you can even do King Arthur's shield for example because it has that emblem on it and he's always carrying it or the monk for example so and anyway all that to say I enjoy riddles all right so going forward here's the monk we talked to him um, our companion did say he thinks that the monk has a grail and you can see the monk is pretty snarky because he says your face <laughs> betrays no signs of great intelligence so he's already kind of uh, shaming our intelligence saying that we're kind of dumb and he just wants to be left alone but he's also a bit crazy we have a quest here um, so we have something to do here. We, we have to take care of this monk, one way or the other. So whether you ask about the well or the grail, this will trigger the monk to run off. Now, you can't do anything with the well until you deal with the monk. And in order to deal with the monk, you'll quickly discover he has created an illusion where there are three of him. And you have to basically, one of the three is real, and they will hit you and do damage to you. I think you can only get hit three times. Um, and then... Uh, you'll die so the other two are illusion the best course of action is to kind of stand near where the doorway is there's you can go into one of the areas and there's a doorway so for example here I should have stayed right there and just continued to swing because he can only come at you in one direction versus if you go out in the open he has multiple directions to come at you and once you find out which one is real you can just kind of focus on that one and not worry about the illusions because the illusions can do you no harm but like right there you can't tell which one just hit us so we already know the one in the back is the real one and 
I couldn't figure out or remember how to swing the sword. So I was literally just walking around, just holding my sword, getting thunked in the head. So I've been hit twice, third time. The real one's the one down at the bottom, he's about to come in, fourth time. So you can get hit four times before he kills you. You can see I tried to be sneaky and come in at the bottom where the monk was originally sitting, but when I came in from the bottom, now he's sitting up on the other rock. <laughs> so you can see I'm saying, damn it, he moved. I don't know what my end goal was had he been there. I think I was just going to try to attack him. So I far, sorry, I forgot to cut this part out when I originally uploaded. I just realized that um, someone had come to the door, so I had hit escape to pause the game. But actually, in this part, you don't have to pause it. Um, so I should have trimmed that part out because someone was at the door. <laughs> I usually do that. Um, I usually put it like on a pause or on a help screen so I know that I can come back when I review the video where to trim it. But apparently, I forgot that someone came to the order and I was going to trim that part. I kind of do the same thing. I've talked about this in my other video, so if you've already heard it before, usually when the save game slots fill, what I do is it'll look like I'm not doing anything, but I'm alt-tabbed out, taking those save games, moving them to their own individual folder, come back into the, same, the game, cancel, then save again, and then it's like I have no save games and I can just save a blank slot. So that way I have all the save games all lined up and I typically, when I remember, I upload them to forums.zerohelp.com on all my playthrough uh, threads that I have on there. And you can see because he um, went from the top, now he's located in a different location. So again, the best move here is to stand at that doorway. Uh, that way you kind of, kind of close him off from being able to attack you from all sides. So now I know which one it is. And down I go. Alright, sorry about the sound you're going to hear. It's a Coke Zero. Unfortunately, Coke Zero does not sponsor this, uh, but I do drink a lot of Coke Zero, so if Coke wants to sponsor this, that'd be great.
So, if you had fun killing this crazy monk, go ahead and click like and subscribe. Tell me how many times it took you to kill the monk. Because I am not having a lot of luck. Finally, got the monk. Now I'm going to say, I thought this part was really weird. With the old ones, um, now that you've killed the monk, our servant, the only servant we've had for centuries, now you have to pretty much be our servant. Of all the things in this game, yes, there is magic. Yes, there are weird things about this game that are not realistic. Um, and maybe I don't know my lore for Camelot well enough, but I don't recall old ones, let alone ones that kind of look like um, squid, spectral, alien things. If it had been the old ones, I kind of wish it had been spectral people in robes, something that looked more human. Uh, I just thought that how they looked looked very odd. Uh, look too alien for what was supposed to be a medieval type game. And so now we see we've defeated the monk. The old one tells us we have to stay. And all of that, we can't seem to open this lock. It's got a special key. The sword doesn't do anything. So we seem to be stuck. But we're not. We're not. We just haven't seen all the screens yet. But I promise you, we'll get there. You know, I use a lodestone right there. And... I can't remember where I would have needed oh <laughs> never mind now I know where I would have needed lodestone it's near the end of the game when you're inside the temple okay never mind continue on So I was thinking there was some kind of thing where you have to pay to open the well, but doesn't seem to be the case. Just seems to be locked. We need a key. And also, I'm spelling altar incorrectly there. It's altar. So that tree seems to allude that when Joseph held the grail and he shoved his staff into the ground, it grew because the grail was close. That's not going to be the case. So because I've already gone down and up on a few screens and not seen anything new, I didn't know there was other screens. Because it feel the screens loop if you go in a certain direction, just like that. So it feels like I'd seen all the screens, so I decided, you know what, if if that's not it, it's gotta be close by. So I just began wandering and see again the the screens loop very, very quickly. Where it doesn't make sense that you just made a left and you're already back here on the right side of it. 
But now we see a new screen. And so now we see an altar for false gods, which is probably the old ones. Spelled altar wrong. And a trinity uh, indicating the three ancient ones we saw, but it's odd because the trinity also uh, represents the Christian slash Catholic belief, um, whatever you want to call it, because uh, the Holy Trinity as well. So, Start with five silver, see if that appeases. Sure enough. And the reason I did silver is because I only had one gold left, and copper was used for the, um, the force sprite. So I was like, silver has to be used somewhere. So let's go with silver. And sure enough, I may have given too much. I actually don't know the required amount to give them. So what I ended up doing is restoring, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And you can see they'll tell you they need more silver. So clearly there is a required amount of silver. So it would appear five silver is indeed the key. We release you from our service. So now we're free to go. We got a key on the altar. So we use the key, it's easily unlocked. We open the well. Let's climb inside. So we can't climb in the well drink from it no so we learned that the water is ice cold
So you'll see I struggled at the well for a while. <laughs> As I feel like anyone would. Even if you look in the well, it just says the waters are dark and reveal nothing. So when you finally reach in, you can get a crystal heart. And it has power that only a wizard or enchantress can control. So we're going to hope that the mule follows us, and it does. Now, things are about to go really, really, really sideways for me. And most of it I'll, I'll just remain quiet about. I'll try um, once we get there. I'll explain what you can use to get through it, or what I eventually figured out. So here we are at this frozen tundra. I'm going to go ahead and save. And I make a little joke, but I lose the mule again. I don't. He just stays behind. Okay, so from here, you'll see that the ice begins to crack. So I go back. And you'll see me move around and try to figure out how to maneuver through the ice. So I keep thinking, when the ice cracks, just pause, move, go a different direction. <laughs> ice, ice, baby. Um, and so I thought that's what you had to do. Like, I literally thought this was just a very painstakingly slow arcade sequence where you just have to, when you see the ice crack, stop and then go and move a different direction. So, you're literally going to watch me die. If you watched it, it's like 30 or 40 times. Um, because, again, I thought that's all this was. We just got to move through the ice. We need to get through it quickly or... Uh, you know, wait for the ice to crack. So you'll see, I'll, I'll keep zigzagging. The ice will crack and I'll move and I'll zigzag. And I thought that's just what we had to do. Figure out where to go. Not the case. Um, the answer to this is you use the frozen heart that we just got. So the frozen heart will guide you. But even with the frozen heart, this arcade sequence is painful because while it guides you and makes it much easier I'll slow it down when, when it gets to that uh, unless I'm still talking when it when I finally figure out what to do um, this should have only been one or two screens at the most like this screen and maybe one other screen and then you're done no I believe there in total there's three 
might even be four. There's either three or four screens of doing this, even with the heart. And even again, even with the heart, this part is painful. To me, it feels like once you've figured out to use the heart, yeah, okay, maybe one, you know, maybe this initial screen and one more screen. So, you know, just a total of two screens to get through and you're good. This should not have gone on to three, let alone potentially four. I can't remember if there is four, but this should have been a, a two screen thing. The initial one, you figure out to use a heart. Uh, another screen where it's a full screen where you have to use the heart to get through it, maybe. And then that's it. Um, this one, again, I'm 99% sure it has three. 80% sure it might even be four. <laughs> uh, so this is the one, this is the part that I did not like. So if you agree with me, uh, don't forget to click like and subscribe, but let me know in the comments what you thought of this part when you played the game. Or even when you watched me play it and watched me die repeatedly. So there we go. I've typed use heart and you can tell if it goes pink, that's bad. If it's gold, you're golden. And the only thing that finally made me think to use the heart is because it talks about how the heart is ice cold and here we are in ice. Now, even, even though I now have the heart, I'm gonna leave it slow. Uh, not so much the game speed that I'm changing here, but I'm gonna uh, I'm not gonna speed it up just so you can see for a little bit um, what a pain in the arse this hard part is because you can see it's gold, it's gold, it's gold, everything's going well, pink. So now we know one of the directions from which I'm moving is bad. So facing this way it turns gold again. So we're gonna go ahead and save. All right, as you can see, I'm saving the game with a funny little title of Heart of Gold because the heart turns gold when it's good. And like I said, I'm just going to let you see here about even though it is gold and it kind of tells you where to turn and where to go. If you have played this part, tell me if the heart really, really helps. I mean, it does, obviously, because otherwise it's a guessing game. But it is absolutely painful you can see like i'm literally taking step by step by step I'm like oh no that's not the right way let me turn around try this way okay we're good save and save and then save so and really had it only been this screen you know you figure it out maybe another screen that'd been fine but i'm pretty sure there are three screens to this so i felt that was a little excessive at this point, you you know the players figured out. Okay, I have to use the heart to cross this very dangerous ice. Maybe I just need to make it through one screen, or maybe one and a half screens. Like you know, you make it all the way across this screen, and then in the other screen that you exit to, whether it's the left, right, or whatever, um, you know, you only have to make it halfway to make it to safe land. Because the players already figured out, I need to use a heart. I have painstakingly moved my way through this ice don't keep punishing me by giving me three or four layers of this painful sequence that's just my opinion uh, if you happen to have liked this riddle thing part here uh let me know in the comments tell me why you enjoyed what i considered the most painful part of this game by far all right i'll shut up now and we'll speed through this
So that's screen number two that we're almost off of. And now screen three. So I was right. There's at least three screens of this. And I think when you get to the fourth, it's only half a screen that you have to get to. Or it might not even be all the way. I think maybe it's just a third screen. And so... <laughs> As you can see, I saved the game as you can't be serious, because this is punishing. Alright, I'll try to be quiet again and let this I sequence finish, but I probably won't. I'm sure I'll have something else to say. It's a commentary video. It's my video. Leave me alone. I can talk if I want to. <laughs> Oh, there is a fourth screen. So I was right originally when I was talking earlier that they are really out to punish you. There's literally four screens. And it's probably four and a half. Because you still have to make it to the other half once you get through this screen. This was completely unnecessary to be this long. This should have been one and a half screens maybe at the most. Players figured out what to do, use the heart, very precarious, painstakingly step through the ice, make it through a screen and a half. Players already figured out what to do, why are you punishing them by making them walk through several screens? Anyway, as you can see, it's on the save. When the replace option is there, what I'm doing is I've alt tabbed out of the game, created a folder for the save game, I'm moving them over. I'll hit cancel and then I'll hit save game and the save games here will be blank so that I can save all of my games and I typically when I do remember I upload them to my uh, playthrough threads on forums.crhelp.com see there you go save game is blank because I've moved them out into their own folder And we finally make it to the Ice Queen. Hooray! So we'll go ahead and go inside of here. And this is where we'll meet the Ice Queen. And we can see our poor companion is uh, in ice, if you will. The Ice Maiden. The unloving manifestation of the Lady of the Lake.
And she says, I sense you have something that belongs to me. Well, clearly, that would be the heart of ice, since she is an ice princess. So, some of the, um, because you are not carrying a lot of inventory items, and the way the game plays out in many regards, um, Conquest of Camelot's pretty easy, because each time you reach someone, you don't have a lot of inventory items to choose from. So for example, when we got to the Hag on the Stone, over on the hill, uh, literally we had like the Rose, the Lodestone, um, the Sleeve, and the Pouch. And so we can kind of guess, even if you even tried to give it to her, there would not be a lot of options if you were to say, give Lodestone, she's gonna say no, give Rose, no give pouch or give money she's not interested in so give sleep so it's very easy you can deduce what items you have to use for some of the puzzles in conquest of camelot in that regard we got here and the only real item that we have that would fit what she wants is her heart And what's funny is I was jokingly, I typed, you can see I typed in there, how did Lancelot get here anyway? And I believe, I need to double check. Um, if I remember correctly, um, in hindsight after I remembered the heart, I think, I don't know how it works. Um, I think you can use the rose that um, is given to you by your, your wife, your queen, if you will. And she has given Lancelot the rose too. You can, you'll see, uh, I think it's near the end, you'll see an image of the three of you standing there and he is also holding the rose. So it stands to reason that the rose could have worked to get him here. I think that's what the rose is for. Because I can't think anywhere else in the game you would use the rose but then again the heart is what you used on the ice so i could be wrong about the rose but somehow i vaguely remember that the rose had something to do with this as well because it's showing love um and it's i think basically because it is a manifestation of the lady of the lake um the loveless version of her and the rose is symbol of love pretty much to lancelot who is stuck in the ice I think it is what um, leads you to safety because she gives a clue when uh, when she gets the when she gives you the rose about like it'll lead you to safety or lead your way. So I think that's where the rose can be used. And so similar to. When we had to free our other companion, our Knight of the Round Table, uh, it involves doing something. And in this case, the Lady of the Lake, she wants us to answer three, answer three riddles. And this is uh, one of the copy protections, copyright protections that the book has. So the flowers on this tree are in the book that talk about kind of what they represent and what they're also known to, you know, associate to. And so in the riddle, A, first you have to find out, which tells you the riddle, you have to know the answer to the riddle and kind of figure out what she's asking and then take that and associate it to whichever flower that is, or rose that is on this tree. Um, so that's part of the copy protection. So she mentions right there the name of the Flower will also uh, reveal the answer to the riddle. So depending on what the riddle is, you then have to look at the flower, see what it represents, and see if that is what it could potentially represent as the um, as the answer. And I had a... I can't remember what it was, but I was trying to start the test to do the riddle. And I, I could have sworn I said, yes, let's start. And then she's like, well, if you're not going to start, you know, forget about it. And I was like, I could have sworn I, I said start. So there you go. She punted me away. So that would have meant in order to do this again, and I assume that if you make your way back over, you can tell her to do the, 
the thing. Who in their right mind would want to do the ice thing all over again? I would pray and hope that everyone saved as soon as they crossed those screens of ice before entering this chamber, just in case anything went wrong, because doing that ice is a nightmare. Again, it's truly probably the only part of the game I did not care for. So one of her dialogue texts, um, you'll see how I saved it, that it flashed by. She says something and it flashes by really quick. And I don't know if I had pressed enter or if there's a timer issue um, with one of her dialogue boxes. Start test will allow us to take the test. Here's the first riddle. You must choose the flower that best answers it. So she'll, uh, and also apparently, because when I did the second playthrough, I noticed that one of the riddles at the, um, at the one where the hag turned the five poetic people into stones and you have to answer their riddles. Um, a good thing to note is the riddles are randomized, so there are different riddles, and so the riddle she'll tell me can vary. So if you see these riddles, you may get a totally different set of riddles, both in those where the stones are and in these flowers. So rather than go through it, I'll just be quiet and we'll try to zip through it. Okay, just letting this flower part go through. Instead of letting this zoom by real quick, just wanted to ask uh, if you have played Conquest of Camelot, what were some of the things that you really liked and what are some of the things you disliked? Because I didn't mind these riddles. Um, I, I talked about it earlier, I enjoy riddles and stuff like that. And I thought it was creative to use, you know, these flowers as a way to have multiple meanings and be the potential answer for riddles and stuff like that. The only thing is, uh, as I said, it did it did decrease the amount of replay I did because I would have to go dig it out of my currently out of my garage. Back in the day, you know, when this first came out, I probably played it a number of times because back then, you know, I only had uh, all my Sierra games in my closet, which was like when where my computer was at the time. It was literally five feet away from me, so I probably played this quite a bit back in the day, but um, ever since, um, what was that, uh, 1992, 3, 4, when I moved, um, that stuff has been in bins and stuff like that, um, and I've not really had room every time I've moved uh, to have them easily accessible in my room, because I have so many freaking uh, Sierra games. Um, plus I have a ton of other hobbies I've mentioned, like I play D&D and stuff like that, so I have all the D&D books from 2nd, 3rd, do not have the 4th, but I have all the 5th edition books, plus all the novels I enjoy reading, so, and then there's tons of Star Wars Legos in my room. Um, so there isn't always a lot of room every time I move to put the Sierra games close to me, so they always end up in the garage. So the ones that don't have a lot of uh, copy protection, or ones that I can bypass easily, like the Leech Shoot Larry Age ones, those are easy. Um, and like the King's Quest ones where it's tell me the word on the page, whatever. Um, I had, probably still have, 
uh, an answer key to all of those questions. So those were always like on a PDF and stuff like that. But these, you know, like uh, Conquest of Camelot, these things were in thick books and number of pages long for each area. So like the flowers, I think, is like two or three pages. The area that talks about the the different goddesses and her different symbols, that's a few pages because there's also symbols on top of just the text and stuff like that. So these games, once I moved, I did not play as often. But it's kind of cool because when I played it, it, whatever it was, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago now for the channel, uh, I was genuinely blown away because it had been a while since I've played Conquest for Camelot and I forgot, A, how beautiful the game is, how well designed it is, except for the ice part, uh, and the music. The music is astounding in this game. I really, really, really like the music in this game. Anyway, all of that to say, tell me what you enjoyed or didn't enjoy about Conquest of Camelot, and don't forget to click that like and subscribe. And since right now, as I'm recording this, it is February 11th, and we're on a thing with flowers, what are your plans for Valentine's Day? Do you have any plans for Valentine's Day? Some people uh, are alone, and they're okay with that. And some people have plans to take out their significant other. Some people just buy flowers, and that's good enough. Uh, if you have any ideas, I have a wife of over 20 years. Um, I'm going to be honest, I've not planned anything yet. And uh, just earlier today, she made a joke of, oh, you've probably already bought my Valentine's gift, right? And I was like, <laughs> oh boy. So... Um, if you have plans for Valentine's Day, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear it. Uh, maybe give me an idea. Alright, so we're done with the riddles. Okay, so we got all those answered. We got it all figured out. I love that I talked about that I would speed through it and not really talk about it, and yet I rambled through most of it. Because that's what I like to do. I like to ramble, apparently. And so she frees Lancelot from the ice and... She says, I'll return him to Camelot. And he was placed there because he had scorned her love. Because he loves another, which is, you know, the queen. Your wife. And so she says, she's freedom. Sent him back. Your journey continues. May you prevail with the same wit and courage you have shown here. And then she'll teleport us as well. But not back to Camelot. Back to where the mule is. Now we are rapidly approaching where I meet the dead end in this gameplay. And again, so what I did in this one is um, after I dead end and I try a few things, try to go back to Camelot, realize I can't go back in and stuff like that, I ended up just starting a new game. And it shows the prayer scene and then I kind of just speed up everything else in the commentary video. So everything else will be sped up so you're not seeing me walking through the ice all over again. All of that will be sped up. Because no one needs to see all of that again and hear me whine and complain about the, <laughs> the ice sequence. So here is where I dead end. I cannot afford passage on the book. Uh, on the boat, sorry. So I am not able to go where I need to go. Now, I do remember someone posted, it's probably years ago, that there is, I don't know if it's in the game or if it's in the code, there's a Easter egg uh, about how Christy Marks, who wrote and designed the game, says, you know, Christy Marks loves, and then it was the name of her husband. Um, 
I, I thought it was the sign, so that's why I'm walking over here and I'm trying to read the sign. I don't remember how to trigger what it says, because if you try to read it, it says you can't. Um, so it might have just been in the code of the game and not able to be triggered in the game itself. I don't know. I tried a few things, couldn't get it to go. Um, but there you have it. So he mentions that Sir Galahad has sailed from here, but he's not returned. And you would think a king, since he knows who I am, would be good for his word that when I come back, um, I'll gladly pay for the voyage, but nope. Take your fare myself, or by law, every man, even a king, must pay his way. A law, apparently king, I almost said King Graham, uh, King Arthur uh, set up. So we need to go to Gaza, and that is three gold coins. And I have one gold coin, uh, I can't remember how much silver and some copper, and even if you total that stuff up, <laughs> see, yeah, one gold, four silver, 14 copper. And that's not even gonna come up to two gold. So, I am um, out of luck. So this is where I try to go back, <laughs> back to Camelot, and It'd help if I knew my geography. <laughs> but as you can see, Camelot's gates do not open. You may not return, Arthur, until you have found the Grail or died trying. That's great. Thanks, Merlin. You couldn't just open the gate since I'm your king so I can get, like, two gold, go back, and pay for a, <laughs> pay for a ship? Seems pretty stupid. I mean, to be fair, that is a, a rather silly dead end. Like, I get that, you know, the guy only gives you so much gold and you have to make do with that. But logically, if a king returned to Camelot to say, hey, I just need to go to the treasury, get two gold coins, and I'll depart again on my voyage, you would think that people would be like, oh yeah, you know, let the king in. This is part of finding the grail, and he just needs two gold. So, such are not the people, and such is not Merlin. They do not, uh, they don't care if you just need two gold and you're out there trying to find the grail and rescue your friends, by the way. Rescue the knights of the round table. 
Maybe it was a plot by Lancelot all along. He knew I was short some cash, and now I can't come back. And now he can have the hand of the queen. Oh, dude, did I just make a cool sub-story? No. No. I am mostly just talking to hear my own voice. <laughs> It's my last, last ditch effort, knowing that it's not even nearly enough. Yep, yeah, that's not enough. I'll return your coins so you can count them again. end up starting a new game, re rinse, repeat. It is all going to be sped up, and it'll probably be even sped up faster, because I'm not going to speak to this stuff again. So, um, when I do the post-edit afterwards, I'll trim it even further so it's even faster than it is already. So, not the part where I'm talking, because it's only the parts where I'm not talking that I speed up faster. So this part's already sped up because we've already done this, so I've already pre-sped this part up before doing this version of the commentary video. So I'll go ahead and be quiet and uh, let this go through. Yeah, so right there, the queen said, wear it, it'll guide you through. So I bet you it's used for the ice also. It's either used for the ice, or there's an area where you're in a temple. But in that one, you just kind of need to pay attention to direction. I think the temple is where the lodestone is used. But I didn't even use the lodestone. I actually ended up drawing a map <laughs> of the temple so that I knew which way was north, east, south, and west. Now, to be fair, I don't know if you have to give a gold per thing here at the altar. I just assumed that seemed to be the thing to do because it is a holy place and whatever, you know, don't be cheap. So you might not even have to give a gold coin here. But again, something I learned when I replayed this time is after I did this, I went back to the treasury um, gave him the purse, he dumped out the coins that were in there, and then basically refilled it exactly back to what it was, which is 5 gold, uh, 10 silver, 15 copper, I believe. So that allows you to basically pray, donate a gold each, and then still go back and get your coin back at the treasury. All you have to do is say, uh, give purse, he'll empty it, 
and then you just tell him to get copper, silver, and gold, and then you're set back to where you were. There's the lodestone that I, I think I may have used to get initial readings in the temple. I don't remember. It's been, whatever, it's been like two or three weeks, maybe a month since I played. Side note, I would have never known what a lodestone was uh, if it wasn't for back in the, I want to say the 80s. Um, like 81, maybe 80, um, there was a magazine format of a black and white comic called Elf Quest, and there is a character, Skywise, in the original Quest that was in the magazine format back then. Uh, within the first issue, he gets a lodestone and uses it as a necklace, uh, but his is a... This is one from Meteorite, like a star, like a real lodestone, versus this one is just a sword on a string. So, little connection of how I know what a lodestone is. And because of ElfQuest, I became obsessed with getting a lodestone. And I have one somewhere that I don't know where it is anymore. So we're off on our quest all over again, <sighs> which will mean repeating the ice sequence all over again. <laughs> so we'll speed all of this up. And so once again, you can see that it's at a replace section. So what I'm doing is all tabbing out of the game and uh, basically clearing out a save game and a new save. All right, we're still speed running through this, but uh, we'll encounter the first part. That is the uh, arcade sequence of the boars. And you can see clearly even on the playthrough, I did not have a good pattern down as back to back the boars are getting me on the first try again I don't understand why they didn't allow saving between this sequence uh, just punishing the player really
and you can see I've slowed the game down as possibly as slow as it can get and this is a sped up playthrough and managed to finally get all three boards it took turning the game speed all the way down on my second playthrough to easily quote doing air quotes to pass that and then uh, you'll see the blue sleeve and then coming up is the black knight another arcade sequence um, but at least that one like I said I kind of figured out always go for his right shoulder pretty much and you should be able to knock him off before he knocks you off three times ideally Naturally, that was one of the times he he defends his right shoulder. But there you go. Didn't defend his right shoulder that time. Knocked him off. He defended. Did not defend. Knocked him off. Did not defend. Knocked him off. So in my second playthrough, again, as I said, finding out about the right his right shoulder made it much easier to defeat the Black Knight. So... If you are stuck trying to fight the Black Knight, gun for that right shoulder of his. He typically leaves it open, and as long as your shield is up slightly to defend against his, you should win. All right, so we're back to normal speed now because we actually have sufficient funds to go to Gaza this time. I think during the sailing portion, it would have been kind of cool if they kind of did something similar to what they did with Gold Rush. That while you're on the ship, you help out and do a few things, like a storm comes and you have to go get something from below deck and bring it up to someone else to help them along. But it does talk about how, um, you know, you get to know the crew and all that other stuff. But it would have been cool to actually do stuff on the ship as a part of it. And we make it to Gaza. So now we are in a new territory in terms of uh, my first playthrough where I got stuck. We've officially afforded the trip to Gaza and we're now there. And we are apparently very intoxicated uh, because Merlin is trying to reach us. And you'll notice there are two people here. There's a dude who's standing off to the side uh, with the black robes and the, the white turban 
And then there's a young boy petting a mule. They each want your attention. And the young boy says, come with me to my master. He wants to help you. The other guy says, I'm a tour guide. There's no way you're getting through the desert without me. So of the two, it certainly feels like Sierra would not make a child be evil. <laughs> so it seemed like pretty obviously as, as a player that um, the kid is the better choice between the two. So you have Azim and Jabbar, and uh, we're going to go ahead and go with the kid. And Jabbar over here, who said you'll never make it, and even has like the black sinister dialogue box. Well, the boy has a light blue and very soft and welcoming. So um, the gentleman, the older gentleman here, will continue to be a thorn in our side. Um, since we do pick the child, he does do a few things to try to get in our way. Uh, he does make one last ditch effort later to try to pitch us to go with him. But uh, it is best to avoid him because in the end, he is just going to try to kill you. Um, he ends up in an area, later on we'll see it, where there's a poison lake. And there's like dead animals and he says, your animal looks parched. Why don't you and your pet take a drink and uh, obviously he's looking to poison you, rob you, do whatever, or just stop you from getting to the ground, whatever the case might be, whatever his agenda is. And so when we speak to this gentleman who is that boy's master, um, this is where I also took notes because you'll want to ask him about the goddesses and he'll draw the symbols on the ground and what each one of them represents because you'll need it later. So definitely talk to him, get this information. It's also in the book, but it was much easier just to have it in my notes. In fact, in this playthrough, let me double check. Yeah, so I have a, uh, a board, this thing, this thing here, where I note when I take my medication. So I have a note for when I take it in the day and the night, and on the back of it is where I drew the notes for Isis, Venus, Vesta, Athena, can't read my writing, and a name uh, I can't also read, but it also has the symbols there. It has the same directions that I mentioned before, the W-E-S-E-S-N. -E -E and so it's got a couple of things here that uh, are notes. It's very similar to, <laughs> to the notes that was in my original uh, Conquest Camelot box. It's literally almost all the same notes, except it doesn't have the score and all that. I don't think I took note of my score, like when I played, like, I don't remember it saying this is what you got. It may have. It may have, actually. I just don't didn't write it down, so it didn't stick in my head. So we know that our good friend is in Jerusalem, and uh, I will say, earlier I talked about how up until now, the quest is pretty easy. Um, the people you, you encounter, you typically only have one item that gives that makes any sense to give to them. Uh, we're about to go into a town where there's, I think it's like eight different people, all have eight different issues. Some of them have issues with one another, so you've kind of got to figure out how one person's problem will fix another person's problem by fixing that person's problem over there. And there is a part where one of the people is a female, she is upstairs and she won't come out, but you can get her to come to the window. And finding the right command to get the item to her, which is a mirror, was very, very difficult. It reminded me very much of the troublesome Leash Suit Larry 2 at the very end, having the right commands. So there was a part that I was stuck on just trying to figure out how to get something to her. And Speaking of currently, the, this is where he's drawing the various symbols. So that was the symbol of Isis. He's already drew, drawn a few of the other ones. So 
When you play, take note of the symbol and the name that is associated with it. You're also going to need the manual to understand how each one of these um, symbols and names are like associated said, to something. Definitely um, make note of those symbols. And again, you will need the copy protection uh, manual, or you could probably just Google it and find someone who has put this information online. But it's better if you purchase and support the game and the, and the folks who distribute this, such as GOG, not, not the abandoned wear type sites. So this guy, when you talk to him, will provide a good amount of information. So definitely ask him about your companion, the gods, and all the other things you can totally think to ask him. And we're about to depart now and head into the dangers of the desert. Now, thankfully, unlike several other Sierra games where they would create a desert um, Quest for Glory 2, King's Quest 5, where there's probably others, I was just thinking of those two, um, where you would go in a random direction and you could potentially just get lost in the desert very easily. Uh, either through luck or it's not that, or it's not possible, I mean, or it possibly is possible, but um, maybe they don't have as many desert screens. I, I moved a few screens and I, I immediately felt like, okay, this doesn't seem like the right path. Let's uh, let's go back and backtrack a few and you'll see that, you know, I'll talk about it when I get to it. So this is the same gentleman from the pier who said, hey, follow me, I'll be your guide. And when we followed the boy, he said, you're making a mistake. Only I will be able to get you through the desert. And if you try to ask him any questions, he'll tell you, uh, why would I answer you if you don't hire me as a guard? So, or not as a guard, but as a guide. So his reluctance to even be remotely beneficial made me affirm that choosing him was not the right way to go. And so, for example, when I looked at this screen, um, the, <laughs> the rock in the center looked like something that you would push and move, but you can see I hang to the left and kind of stick to the shadows because I don't know if staying in the sun too long will actually impact um, the character and maybe heat. And just verifying that to the left, there is actually no passage. So already I'm going to start saving because it is an open desert. It's not something that immediately led into a different screen, so I save it as Desert 01. Because I don't know how many desert screens I'm about to go into. So if you've ever been lost in the desert, uh, go ahead and click that like and subscribe and tell me about a time that you too were lost in a desert that looked oddly just vast and endless. And hopefully, if you're lost in a desert, you actually did find your way back, and that's why you're watching this channel. And you're not actually currently lost in a desert looking for help and somehow on this YouTube channel. As you can see, it, it don't know whether it's because the donkey got stuck behind the rock, or when I was moving to, I guess you'd call it east if your north is up, um, the donkey was not following. <laughs> And then it did the Quest for Glory thing, where in Quest for Glory 2, if you ride, I'm just going to call it north because it's too, or south actually, if you ride downward, it gets to a point where the screen flips and then you're coming in from the opposite direction. That's exactly what this did. And I am personally not a fan of that because, as you can see, now I went that way, now I'm back this way. It makes mapping the area virtually impossible so even if <laughs> even if you try to map out the desert so you could potentially survive it it the flipping of the map completely ruins any opportunity to try to make a map and make it useful 
in terms of which way to go, what you've seen, what might be there. Is there like an oasis of water? So I hate the flipping of the map. I complained immensely about that in Quest for Glory 2. So you can see we're back to the one screen that we were at when we first entered the desert. Most lot, and you can see I had the map. Uh, and so I was trying to draw a map of the desert and I saved it as flipping because I hate flipping map screens like that. So now I'm just gonna go north and south and see if it flips as well. And already that's a good indication. We got some shade, which is what it looks like we had to the north. And then right there, so it's pretty easy, south and to the right, there is an oasis. Now if you watch the mule, the mule go towards it, but then not drink it. And you can see the bones just off to the side, and the guy's like, you know what, quench your thirst. But clearly the, um, the mule shows no desire because he walked away from it. And then there was that skeleton, so you can pretty much bank on your own that this water is probably poisonous. So, clearly he's trying to get you killed, potentially rob you. So, let's get rid of him permanently by drawing our sword here in a moment. I think this is where I did it. There might be one more time that we meet him, but I think this is where I draw the sword and scare him away. So just trying to see if you can uh, exit over to the right through the river, since you can actually go and walk in the river. But all the screens that are connected to the river, stream, whatever you want to call it, are all blocked off. So I'm saving the save game basically just by the map. So the E stream means east of the stream. So now we have this place here. Got some stairs. And I will tell you the perception threw me off initially. even tells you it's a lethal fall from here. So I thought when I went right there that I was on the stairs, but I was not. Apparently I was off a little bit. I thought they did a really good job, by the way, with how the mule descends down the stairs. Just small touches like that. And we see the mule drink the water, so we know that water is probably safe to consume here. And also, the girl had a whole bucket of water, so probably safe to drink here. So as we head north from here, we can see that there is a town up ahead. And we see some people who say that the gate is closed and uh, don't really want to let us in. This took me a while. And so that was not the way to go about that. Four to one does seem like pretty bad odds. So 
So that was a little bug. So I had drawn the sword, stepped off the side and fell and it showed the screen still shaking. But if you look, he literally walked under everyone, gets killed and then surfaces again at the bottom alive, but then it shows a restore. So that was a weird little bug. I tried to replicate it, uh, I think right after. So I think this next effort is to try to replicate that same bug. Um, but I don't think I was ever able to replicate it again. You know, if I were smart, I would just save right at the top instead of always having to walk right back up the path. So it looks like five coppers enough to sedate their bloodthirst and highway robbery. So we're going to go to the other gate that they mentioned that we have to go to. So now this guy wants a fee as well. But this time we'll draw a sword, see if he's as brave as the other guy, since he doesn't have a posse behind him, and he's not. Alright. And then we're just going to go ahead and go inside the city. Alright, so now we are in the Bazaar of Jerusalem. Um, remember before how I had said that the game was easy once as I said once we get here it starts getting a little tougher as we can see a thief just took our thing this guy is closing up shop the girl at the top just closed her window um, so things are a little more complicated now and you will discover that everyone here has an issue with someone else And so already the first guy is talking about how he's going on a caravan and he notices a mule and must pry, you know, we must prize her greatly. So already we can tell that we can probably sell the mule to him. So that's what we're going to do. This poor mule has, who has been with us all the time, even though the mule has left us a few times. Um, you know, this mule has been with us. I don't know where our food pack and all that other stuff ended up, but you know. We are uh, going to go ahead and sell the mule. And you're going to discover that the other people in the um, bazaar. And the thing is, so with this bazaar, you'll see that we are going to go to the right. And there's a number of shops. But you can also, from here, go down. And you'll see an equal number of shops basically almost going, it would be technically going the other way. And so there are a lot of characters here, each with their own issue with someone else typically, and you kind of have to figure out what it is you have to do for each person. So the first one, pretty easy, right? We just sell the mule and uh, he takes the mule. So off goes our mule, which is fine because we're not going to need the mule for the rest of the game. Now right here you can see it's technically two and a half. The guy on the far right um, won't talk. And this guy has like plates, and jugs and stuff like that. And we're gonna see the next guy over is a fisherman and the fisherman is causing problems with other people. And you see this guy talks about selling mirrors. So he sells a number of different things, including jewels. So we're going to have to figure out what we need to get from this guy, because he just listed off a bunch of stuff. 
and here we can see that this guy is essentially selling fish. The fish <laughs> and the well-fed cat. Um, it's the smell of the fish that's basically causing issues. And you can see the birds down there by the barrels to the right. That is a significant clue for later. That took me a while to pick up on. And so he is a grain merchant. And you'll notice right above where he's standing right now, where Arthur was standing, there's two birds up there as well. And this is the inn slash tavern. And here we see what appears to be a hermit, someone down on their luck. I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert. This guy is more than what he appears to be. Now I've always wondered up in that upper right hand corner, um, just to the right, all the way at the end, is it me or does that look, look like it could be poop? Because I was like, oh, it's a hermit and there's poop. And you might think there's no way they put poop in this game. And see, you can see that I've just hit the other side of the bazaar. But you'll see, we'll go, um, so at some point in here, I'll wander into an alleyway, which shows some, uh, you could say, some, uh, some art, if you will, on the wall. <laughs> And so there is that. And so this guy sells relics and stuff like that. And so this is one of those things where I thought um, we were going to have to look in the copy protection book about certain relics. And so when I was trying to find out like what relic he sells, it took me a, a while because I went through the whole book and I could not find anything about a relic. And he says, oh, what's the name of the relic you're looking for? And I was like, okay, this has to be in the book somewhere. And I could find nothing in the book. So I end up creating a random name. And he says, oh, I have a relic of whatever you write down. And I was like, okay, well, this is this probably is not the right relic. This isn't going to work for what I need to do. Um, ironically, I think the relic goes to this guy or it's another guy similar. Anyway, I thought it wasn't going to work. Um, as it turns out, when you get to that guy and you need to name a relic, uh, you can name it whatever you want. So if you want to name it after your name, if you want to name it after King Arthur, if you want to call it the Holy Grail, uh, it has a number of character limits, but pretty much you can fill it up with whatever you want. And that is actually the relic that will work in the game because it's, you know, it's a fake relic. It's not actually a real relic, but the person that you give it to isn't aware that he takes it as a gift. This woman here is also more than what she appears to be, as right there. So Tamra, she already knows your name is King Arthur, and I, and I know your purpose here. So she is clearly a little bit more, and she knows the name Galahad, who also is one of our knights that we're actually looking for, who went this way. So she is more than what she appears to be. And she mentions being a servant of the goddess. Well... If you remember before, when we followed the little boy after um, disembarking the boat and we went to his master, that guy talked about several goddesses. And we can see here that she has apples. So the falls and the dirham and the other coin. It's for something, I think, or dinar. They're all types of coins. I have it written down here, I think. Let me find my cheat sheet if I still have it on my table. Uh, a dinar is a gold, a dirham is silver, and the false fals is copper. I'm probably mispronouncing this. But uh, when she asks for the coins, that's what they are. Dinar is gold, dirham is silver, and false is copper. That is my handy dandy uh, cheat sheet. Similar to the one I found in my Conquest of Camelot book that I mentioned before. Um, that I had like the names of the stuff, the symbols written down. When I replayed this, I wrote it all down again on my cheat sheet, which is on the back of my... <laughs> I have a pill tracker and it's on the back of that. Um, one thing I'll say about this, because <laughs> these playthroughs are so long... 
So for example, I think this one was a little bit over five hours, I think five hours and 45 minutes, because um, this one includes the dead end. Um, what I did before even starting the commentaries, I sped up um, after I do the restart, like after I got dead end, I sped up those portions, except to show like, oh, hey, like I got, I went back to the treasure and got gold again after praying at the, uh, at the two places to kneel and get the vision and the, and the stuff about your knights. And um, what's happened is because it does, it is a commitment to sit down and sit here and um, talk a lot, <laughs> as I tend to do. Um, this has actually been broken up over like four or five days now. So uh, if there's any weird inconsistency, <laughs> it may be because I don't remember what I said two days ago uh, on this. Because a lot of times I'm actually doing this, uh, if I do it Monday through Friday, I'm usually I come home, have dinner, spend time with the wife, and then I go over here. And usually I, to calm myself down, I'll like surf the web for a little while and just let my brain settle down after work. And then I'll do this. And so it, it can be tedious, like talking, like for so long, nonstop, because as much as I like to ramble, uh, typically, like I said, these are kind of typically broken up in a number of days. So all this rambling, <laughs> it's not because I love the sound of my own voice, but it's because, uh, as I said, when I play these games, I don't use a walkthrough, so it's they end up kind of long. But uh, I truly enjoy playing these games, and I truly enjoy like talking about them. It's just I'm realizing that when you have a five-hour video, and like when I'm done, so like I'll after I do my commentary, I'll, I'll put the audio to the video. Uh, render that and then what I do is then I take that pull it back into the editor and, and anywhere where I'm not talking I speed those portions up again so even though this right now this video is at this time five hours and eight minutes long in total by the time I do by the time I put the audio in render it again where I, I speed up the silence parts where I didn't talk and it feels like I've talked a lot so it might not be too much shorter but by the time I do that edit this will be shorter than hopefully five hours because it should at least trim eight minutes so you can see we purchased the food and this poor boy is just starving so we give him food and, you know it says that was a good deed Arthur and so we're kind of showing not only that we take care of not just our own quest, but we take care of others along the way. This was a mistake <laughs> when I was too generous with the hunter, which led to a dead end. But you can see eventually this is going to start having rippling effects because just like in a Sierra game, once you start helping other characters, it starts doing other things. So by the fact that we... So here, so here's that alley, and if you, hold on, if I go back into the alley, so when you go into the alley, to the left of the wall where that dead dog is, up above it, that's clearly a specific type of art, and, um, you know, you can see urine in the corner, because that's clearly urine, there's, I mean, what is, what else would yellow liquid in a, an alleyway B. So, and then we can't read what that thing says, but, you know, there's that. So that's what I was talking about when I was saying, you know, in the corner do where the uh, hermit is, is, is that feces or is, it, is that, or am I crazy? And so that's why I was saying that alleyway had some interesting art, but it also has urine in the corner. So it could be feces to make it look realistic. And so now that we've helped the boy and we've shown that lady generosity, we have to start figuring out how to help everyone else. Now, the easiest thing is, see, this guy talks about the stink of fish. So he is, he's upset and he wishes a curse upon the fishmonger. So we already know that the fishmonger needs to be taken care of in order to help this guy. And so we're starting to get the pieces of who we have to help and how we have to help them.
And so, I'm, oh, I forgot to mention, um, <laughs> we have the thing that when we talk to people, when they speak to us, the first time they talk to us, they will tell their true thing. So, okay, so here it is. So the relic of a saint, and you can name any saint. So see, he says, you know, I have the relic of St. George and he'll sell it to us for a two diner. And the thing is you can come back to him like if I just leave and I don't buy it, he'll ask me again what relic I want. And you can just keep changing the name until you find a suitable name of uh, whatever relic you want to call it. All right, if you've ever been to a bazaar, um, go ahead and click like and subscribe and uh, tell me about the bazaar you went to. Or, you know, swap meet, doesn't matter. Swap meet bazaar, kind of similar. All right, so we know that we need to talk to the fishmonger. We want to try to talk to this man. He's so agitated he will not stand long enough to talk. And that is probably because of the fishmonger. So he talks about wanting to sell the fish, but uh, he gets snarls and complaints from those around him because of the stink of the wind. So he asks him I to change like nature of life itself, command the wind not to blow, which is obviously not going to work. Now if we could find something to cover the scent of the fish, now that would certainly be helpful. So this man has two wishes for the fish smell not to blow his way and to sell something to us. And this is a guy that has a bunch of stuff. So a mirror seems pretty specific. So he says it's for two dinar and a, you know. And there we go. He now Merlin about the coins and he'll explain what is what. But I already said what it was because I had it written down. And it's probably paused on that screen because that's probably right when I'm writing it on the back of my uh, my pill tracker thing that I keep at my desk, which is just uh, probably talked about it before, but it's just a piece of paper. Um, it's actually uh, it's a comic book um, board backing. So like if you buy comics and you put the board in the bag, that's actually what it is. So. And that's how I keep track of my pills. I have the days of the week at the top, and then I put an X if I forgot, or a circle if I remember. Not that you needed all that information, but there you have it. All right, so we just paid for a mirror, and he gives us a mirror. Now, a good guess is that the girl that we first saw um, when we first entered who closed her window as the guy was closing the shop she probably wants a mirror the girl that's at this place now how do we get her attention if we can't get in the door right so we're gonna try nope door doesn't automatically open so we can try to call for the woman yell for the woman <laughs> She says, who are you? All powerful wind. You are a foreigner, but by the look of you, you're not a very rich one. I only have time for rich men. Classy. <laughs> so Abram, who said he, you know, made a mistake with her and left a veil there on accident. She has it, but she doesn't want to give it up unless we can bring something of greater value. And as someone who only wants rich men, she probably wants a mirror. So we offer the mirror, and she says, when I have the mirror, you can have the veil. But if we can't get in there, how do we give her the mirror? If you just type, give her the mirror, she says, my arms are not that long. Now this is where I feel like the game punishes you a little. Because I said, throw mirror to woman. And that says, what a truly mindless idea. So that seems like a bad idea, which in hindsight truly does. Um, if you're going to toss a mirror or throw a mirror, it doesn't seem like she would catch it. 
um, just because you know it's not like a football it's a mirror or the handheld mirrors it's, it's not gonna wouldn't be an easy object to catch for a man woman whatever if you're just flinging a mirror <laughs> so this part seemed <laughs> this, this part seemed a little uh odd <laughs> come downstairs woman <laughs> Uh, and so you try to say come down and that's not working so if you walk away she closes the window and so the door is locked <laughs> this part was truly driving me insane and so it would seem if she closes the window she will not answer so I don't know if you walk off the screen and walk back if she will I just don't know, so I ended up restoring the game. And so knowing that, I ended up spending quite a bit of time trying to get this uh, this mirror to her. And that could be it. Maybe you have to yell for her instead of just call for her. So I wonder if you walk away if that would work. I don't remember if I ended up doing that. So we're going to ask about the veil. She says, if you're a friend of him, he's scum. <laughs> but she doesn't want to give up the veil. Or, yeah, unless you have something. So I tried walking closer to try to give her the mirror. And she says her arms are not that long. Again, I spend... A while here trying to get the right phrasing and it feels very much like Lee Suit Larry 2 where it feels like throw mirror to woman because that is literally what you end up have to, having to do but it's it's a specific phrase that I eventually got right but you figure throw mirror toss mirror something like that which is the same idea um, would have worked but no it doesn't throw and toss are not the right words apparently so again i feel like they could have made throw and toss you know similar words to what is actually needed because it's getting the point across of what you have to do so again if you're wondering it's not that i'm not doing anything i'm actually tabbed out moving the save games into their own folder so I can create basically a brand new set of save games. So again, if you just do throw mirror, that works. But if you say throw mirror to woman, that doesn't work and that seems really really weird so now she's really happy that she has a mirror so now we have the veil so we can return the veil <laughs> and you can see I was a little sassy with the dot 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 because throw mirror and throw mirror to woman should have either one of those should have worked even toss mirror and toss mirror to woman but whatever I digress and just now we just saw a woman carrying a cage with birds that'll be significant in a moment And so it looks like things go well for him. <laughs> uh, so I'd save the game. Uh, we gave him the veil, but we really got nothing out of it. We just made his life better. So, you know, whatever. It helps in our soul points or whatever it is at the, in this game that's divided into a score of three different ways.
So we can see he has those lap lamps uh, hanging, but he's also got other stuff in here. So we know that his cousin has broken his oath to him and thus ruined their friendship. So it talks about other things in the store and you can see that you know there's the lamps hanging but there's also a broom right there there's something green hanging that kind of looks like a vegetable of some kind So he carries charcoal and herbs that are fragrant. They sweeten the air and lend freshness to even the foulest room. Say like a fish vendor? So we got some herbs and some charcoal. So the charcoal will be for the hermit who talks about burning the fire in his thing. And the herb will be for the uh, fisherman so that those around him do not smell the fisherman. But since we're here, we're going to go ahead and give the charcoal to this This. Uh, hermit here, if you will. And once again, we just saw right, she just exited to the left, the woman carrying the birds. So we've given the herbs to the fishermen, and so now people should be more inclined to talk. And you can see the one guy to the fisherman's right, he's no longer pacing, so now we can talk to him. And so he says he has the best grain. So not sure what we need it for yet, but we're going to need the grain. So there we go. We got some grain. Probably already know what it's for because I've already kind of hinted at it if you've not yet played this game. The woman that we've seen with the birds. Because at this point I don't know yet. But the one we've seen for the birds because we see the birds always around the grain. She drops her cage and she needs to get the birds back, so we'll do that shortly. And there she is again. So now that the scent of the fish has been taken care of, we're able to get a slice of ham. We're going to take that ham and we're going to give it, or not ham, but lamb, but we're going to give it to her. She talks about all she cooks is the same thing. She needs some variety, so we give her some lamb. And so she says she's never seen such kindness because we brought it just because she wanted it. And that we're a good example and makes her feel ashamed. And she talks about how she criticizes this poor little boy when she has plenty of food to spare. So. 
She will now feed the boy and clothe him and raise him as if he were her own son. So as you can see, we are making a difference here. He slides under the table, and she grabs him and lifts him up, and now he's behind the table and gets to eat. And his name is Joshua. You must wonder if he's going to plant a tree. So things are moving up. We're starting to figure out who needs what and how to help the people of Jerusalem in this bazaar. curious if you have played this game and you've made it this far into the commentary what was the hardest part for you in conquest of camelot was it here in the bazaar or was it something else that would prove to be more difficult so we're just going to go with saint thomas and look at that, he does have a relic of St. Thomas. That's super convenient. So again, you can just ask him about the relic and he gives you another opportunity to rename it. And again, I was searching the manual because I was certain that there had to be something in the manual about a relic. Or, or a saint that is somehow tied to a relic. So see, once again, it says, I saved it as need to look at the manual. And I was going to call it Let's Play Sierra Games, because at this point I could not find anything, so just went back to calling it Thomas, which is my name. So we take this to him. So we ask about Achman and he broke a oath. So we ask about the oath and he says he'd bring me back a holy relic. Well, look at that. We just happen to have a relic of Thomas, which is a one of a kind relic. Good sir, I am speechless. Surely my cousin Achman has sent this through you. So now we've helped another. I mean, it feels kind of bad because we did falsify how we got it, but, you know, that's all right. And so he says, without a broom, I can't give open for business, but... We just got the broom from the other guy, so now we can give him a broom to open for business. And so this is Ahmed, who was the one who betrayed him, did not bring a thing for him. So he offers up some hospitality, which is kind and generous. And we sleep and we basically have uh, bed bugs raid us. So, you know, it's fine. And so here we see her bird cage is broken and the birds are up there just hanging out. I don't know what they're eating up there, but it looks like they're eating grain. And so she talks about how she get, needs to get it for her mistress. So we need to fix and help her now.
So once again, I'm overthinking it, overthinking it saying use grain to feed birds. I just do use grain. So we have helped everyone around here, so we go back to the apple vendor. Who says, knowledge is our reward. Seek the star and crescent where Fatima dwells. Now that she is now that you are ready, she will admit you. She is the last guardian of the sacred cup. And take also this gift. It's an apple that ends hunger. Slay, uh, kills thirst and eases weariness. So this is Fatima, and she is the uh, I mean, they did a good job with the uh, the dancing animation with her I will say <laughs> but clearly at all costs avoid temptation and I don't know if there was a way to <laughs> to end this dance sooner like I just felt like it kept going on and on and on and I was waiting for her to talk to me so if you also enjoyed that dance sequence she does don't forget to click that like and subscribe <laughs> So even Merlin says he's moved by her beauty and detects power here. I mean, who isn't going to find that tempting? <laughs> And so it would seem she moves in the opposite direction you do. If you come in from the left, she'll move to the right. If you go to the right, she begins moving to the left. So by talking to her and avoiding both of her tempting offers, she will actually help you if you ask her about the grail. So Galahad has come here before us and has entered, and he too said no to her temptation. So good on Galahad. And he did not pass the test of symbols, so clearly Galahad did not have the copy protection manual for the game. So we have to prove that we're not bound by material possession, so we have to give her our purse of gold. And coin, which I don't know why, but we do. Lady, lady dancer tests a one. 
So this would require the copy protection manual because she is about to ask you about this. You have to know the symbols, which the old man has already told you. And she will ask about each of the specific areas and something about them. So you choose a niche and I'll pose a question. You must know which goddess is it. So you have to know the symbol and then the, the various detail about each of those symbols and that goddesses, how they're represented. So we know this one in the ancient times, her, her name is Shining. So now we have to look at the goddess, or first, yeah, look at the goddess, find where it talks about one of these symbols is a goddess and mention shining, match to the symbol, and then put it to that square. So yeah, this would be, I know I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again, this would be one of the reasons that probably I did not replay this as often as I would have liked to, because this is actually a really, really fun game. Um, really well done. And really, you could... Other than the ice part, um, it's actually pretty easy to get through. Um, nothing is too crazy complex, again, except for the ice part. There are the arcade sequences with like the boar and the, uh, the mad monk. But there's like a number of these type of copyright things that you need to have the copyright manual handy for. And I'm sure there's probably a way to shortcut. Uh, these questions, I'm sure they're randomized, so there's probably, you know, whatever, like 36 different questions, but once you played enough times, you could write down the questions or just keywords, you know, like shine or whatever, and know that that symbolizes that specific goddess or that symbol. So, like, for this one, you could probably look up grains and find out who it is that, you know, is associated with grains, which goddess and which symbol is that goddess. And that last one, the reason I'm taking so long, I'm just making sure that I got the answer right and that it still aligns that that one is the last choice. So our wisdom is great, we have passed the test. So now we have to find the Aerophant. Ancient is he, and he is wise, yet shunned by fools who fear his guise. So ancient, the old guy, shunned by fools, the hermit. So he is the clearly the hermit in disguise. So he'll give us entrance to the catacombs. Pardon me, you're about to hear a Coke Zero open. Again, Coke, if you're listening, uh, not that you sponsor, but if you want to sponsor me, I drink a lot of Coke Zero on this channel. <laughs> so there are cursed rats whose bite is poison. You'll die slowly if you are bit. Even the slightest bite means certain death. If bitten again, the end comes more quickly and with great agony. So we're given an elixir to basically cure from a bite. But it is only one dosage, so don't waste it. Double tap to the floor and the door opens to the catacombs. Have you ever been in a catacomb? If you have, click that like and subscribe and tell me about the time you were in a catacomb. What catacombs were you in? Um, the most famous one I can think of is the one that is beneath um, France. I believe it is 
the one that is full of all the skulls. I can't remember what it's called for the life of me at the moment, but that's probably the most popular catacomb I can think of off the top of my head. So if you've been in that catacomb or any other catacomb, let me know. And already you can kind of see like the rat over to the right near that mummy. You see kind of like eyes flashing. And this is where I'm very paranoid. Because clearly to the left, there's that mummy that's wearing that ornament beneath that blue star. Clearly that ornament's something we need, but I suspect if we reach for it, something bad's gonna happen. See, any closer and the rats will get you. So we need a way to get it. Um, and that's funny because if you look at your inventory, um, one thing it doesn't really list, but you do have it, is your sword. So, Lodestone shows us which way is north, so that doesn't work, so we're going to try to use our sword. And I'm just thinking a rat's going to jump out, we're going to attack the rat, but no. That will not be the case. And there's a dreaded rat running towards me, so I'm going to try to quickly exit the room and hope it doesn't chase me. So I'm wondering if there's a timer if you spend too long in a room that it'll trigger a rat coming at you. So since the rats are there, we're going to try to use the sword to get it, and that actually works. The rest is kind of mapping everything, kind of going into a room to see what's there. And kind of make a map, because now that I've used lodestone, I've got an idea of which way is north, south, east, and west, based off that quick usage. I love my commentary throughout, like sometimes I type commands into the thing, like, this feels like a trap, and sure enough, as you get close to it, the thing starts to open. And the thing, sa the thing says, I smell warm blood and live flesh, come closer, I have a golden treasure. So it retreats from the medallion, so if you get it, if you try to do this without the medallion, you'll die. And inside is a solid gold apple, which we've seen, you know, we were given an apple by the vendor in the bazaar, so the apple seems very symbolic of something. Tied to the goddess, perhaps. And then I'm just saving the game as just justly paranoid, because this whole thing seems out to get you. I do like the um, the murals that they have. I think they did a really good job with the murals. Although I do feel like this was a failed chance to, with that Minotaur, to do a nod to King's Quest V. I'm sorry, King's Quest VI. But I don't know if King's Quest VI was out at the time. I'd have to look at the dates. But I feel like some of these murals could have been a nod to... <laughs> to something so at this point I remember I'm trying to double check my map because when I entered that room it felt like the same room I was just in and by doing that and going into this room that's where the medallion was and over to the right will be where the crypt was so my map should be correct, but it's not. And a rat jumps down and freaking bites me. Eh, well, there's nothing you can do to avoid it. <laughs> Even one bite was lethal. And it seems as Galahad has fallen prey to the rats as well. So you have a choice. Do you save Galahad, or do you save yourself with the 
elixir you've been given because it's only got one dose. And being the being the wonderful king that we are, the giver, uh, we give it to Galahad. And it says the only way out is to bring the gift to Aphrodite. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, oh, and he goes into a healing coma before he can tell us what we need to bring. But considering that we were given an apple by one of the goddess's guardians, you can probably bet it's a golden apple we need to give her. But now we just need to find her. So we know that Galahad will be taken care of. We just need to finish our mission now. The reference of I screamed is when the rat jumped out at me. Because <laughs> it does a sound when the rat jumps out. And uh, knowing I only had one elixir, I assume that I am now slowly dying. So I need to hurry up and get things done. And it looks like we have found Aphrodite. And if we look at her, it's a stone statue of Aphrodite in the center of the room. Upon her hand rests a carved dove, but the other hand, though held out with a palm open, is empty. So we're going to go ahead and give her the golden apple. So now she's going to tell us how to escape the catacombs. Every door within the catacomb is a possible trap. If you leave the safety of this room too soon, you may be trapped forever within a tomb. You should know something of her history. I will pose six questions to test your knowledge. Each question requires one word in answer. When you answer all six, I shall reveal to you the way out. As for the sacred cup, it lies beyond the catacombs. You will not find it here. And so it's another thing where you have to look at the copyright to know where this guy did live. So on some of these where it took me a while to find it, I do end up trimming that portion so you're not just sitting there staring at this question for like 18 minutes while I'm trying to find the answer. I left some of the delay in here just to show that it is not easy to always find the answer. Uh, in the copy protection manual. I mean, I feel like the answer is just you, because she is Aphrodite. So now I have to find him in the copy protection manual. But he wrote a chariot. So we are given the dove and we've proven our sword and shield. To escape the catacombs, you must enter six doors exactly as I tell you. If you choose a door that is wrong, you'll find yourself forever trapped. You begin here by choosing the first door you must enter. The doors you choose must face the direction I give you and you must enter them exactly in this order. West, east, south, east, south, north. So that is on the back of my, it was also written on my original Conquest of Cramelot thing, but that is the, I mentioned this earlier, the W-E-S-E-S-N -S -S written on there. Those are the directions. So I'm writing, that's the reason it's probably paused is I'm looking for someone to write it down, which happens to be my pill tracker. And she says, I have no fear for Galahad. So he's been taken care of. And she said, I will not speak with you again. So we're going to use the lodestone again now that we're kind of in a new area to figure out which way is north, south, east, and west.
All right, we're gonna head up these stairs. And this one admittedly uh, took me a, a sec. Well, there's a part that's coming up. There's a guy we have to fight. That took me, I think, two or three tries to beat him. Um, I realized I, when I did it, I did something in the incorrect order. But then after that, in terms of locating the grail here, you need to again know about the goddess and how it works and the sacred number and which way that sacred number flows. So this took me a while. But this is literally almost the end of the game. So to the right, there is something to do over there. All right, from here, we can see that there's a stairway down and there's that weird symbol in front of the stairs, but let's continue to explore out here first. And aha, Saracen, infidel, you must defeat me if you would win the grail. So we must match sword and shield, strength and skill until one of us is dead. But I wish for an equal fight, and you do not have a helmet, therefore I offer you one. Wear it or not as you please. So again, I think he defeats me maybe twice. Like uh, the combat, in terms of controlling, it's in the manual, so also important to look at the manual in terms of how to combat, but one thing I should have done here, uh, since I've been bitten by the rat, I'm already at a weakened state. So we do have that um, apple that we could have bit. And you'll see that I'm quickly flailing about <laughs> trying to trying to determine where his shield is and see if he has a pattern. Um, but we're overexerting ourselves. We need to slow down because then our attacks become much slower and we get much easier to hit because we are not able to really defend ourselves so well. So keeping the shield right about in the middle seems to do a lot of good in terms of his hits. And The combat here is really weird because the shield gets in front of our face. Uh, I wish they would have gone with one of the models of Quest for Glory. So if you agree, go ahead and click that like and subscribe if you haven't already. And do you agree with me that how this combat system here works could have been better? Like, it should have gone to more of a Quest for Glory. My preference would have been one, where he is in front of you and you're, you know, you're pretty much peering over your shoulder view. And you have your sword and shield similar to quest for glory because they already had that system and i'm pretty sure quest for glory one at least one predates conquest for camelot or conquest of camelot i'm sorry so i'm pretty sure they already had that kind of system it would have been kind of cool if they had already gone that route because quest for glory one of all the quest for glory games is my favorite version of combat so it'd been cool if they followed that method, or at least Quest for Glory too, because this this feels very clunky. Uh, I'm not going to harp on it too much. I know it sounds like I have. I'm just giving a suggestion that they already had a method of doing some kind of fighting in a Sierra game, and it'd been cool to use a system they already had developed. Again, I'm pretty sure Quest for Glory one or Heroes Quest, probably at this point. Uh, predated Conquest of Camelot, but I'm not 100% certain. But I will, uh, I will stay silent, because if I remember correctly, it takes a while for the first two combats to happen, or to end, 
and I think I beat him on the third, so I will keep my mouth shut from here on out until this combat ends. More than likely. You know, with me, you can never tell. See, I've already broken my word. I've already talked before I, uh, before the fight ended. Anyway, this time, shh, I promise. One battle down. And we'll save before we head the other way because that fight took so long. So once again, he offers up the shield, but we're going to eat the apple first. The apple's potent spell has relieved your hunger and thirst and given you strength. But alas, it does not stop the rat's poisonous bite. Just a flesh wound. We'll get back up and uh, try it again. I wish I could offer some kind of tip for this fight, um, but there was none that I found. It was pretty much a lot of random clicking and swinging and hoping for the best and not to have my leg severed. Um, so if you happen to know of a good way to beat um, Saracen, uh, if there is a tip, something to look for us to know when to strike or when to defend, I would love to hear it in the comments, because it does seem pretty random, and the fight does seem pretty clunky in terms of being able to defeat him and seeing the fight mechanics. There isn't much to, you know, swinging forward or backward and stuff like that, um, or swinging forward and moving backward. Um, eventually, I think in the third fight, I am able to finally drive him backwards. And I think that's an indication that things are going much better. But uh, for sure, did not really find a... Like with the Black Knight, I kept saying, always aim for his upper right shoulder. And it typically is the weak spot. But it's like the boars, I didn't really find a good spot as to how to fight the boars. And so it was the same with him. I just couldn't find the pattern, if there is one, as to when to strike or when to defend against him. So if you do know, like I said, I would love to hear it in the comments, because for me it was a lot of random clicking and hoping for the best, and so far two times didn't work out for the best. Also, I realize that it's sitting on this restore screen for a while. Normally, if I'm playing and like someone comes to the door, I make a note of the gameplay and like where I am in terms of the gameplay to edit that out. But apparently, whatever was the delay here, I don't know if like food arrived or something, and I just forgot to mark it down because I was hungry. And DoorDash or whomever showed up. <laughs> but yeah, I should have caught that and edited that out. My apologies if you watched that and was wondering what was happening in the uh, normal playthrough. In this playthrough, it'll be sped through and it won't be as noticeable.
I will say it looks like in this one I'm strictly focusing on heavy hits based on that swing that I have uh, King Arthur doing. So I don't know if that's what I was relying on is just heavy hits to knock out as much health. Every once in a while you can see I am connecting. Sometimes it is hard to tell if I'm connecting or not or if he's connecting. But you can see he took a few steps back. now I'm playing more of the defensive side so I'm not swinging as much and I'm trying to look to parry and there we go so apparently I just relied on heavy hits and began to parry when it said I was exhausted We've killed Saracen in a fair fight, and now he's transformed into a dove and rose to the sky. And now that the fight's over, the helmet also disappears. So we're going to go ahead and save the game, because do not want to repeat that fight again. If you look at the spiral, that is a clue as to where to find the grail. Once we get here and look at the dove, it changes. And we would see Aphrodite again. Where you stand once my priestess has stood. how her statues were housed within. The leftward spiral upon the threshold, reminder of the turning ever onwards. So if you've ever had a ghostly encounter similar to King Arthur seeing the spirit of Aphrodite, um, go ahead and click that like and subscribe and let me know in the comments what was your ghostly encounter like I should do something uh, about strange encounters I love that type of stuff the supernatural that type of stuff but that's that'll be for a different time I do not need another hobby anyway you've won the sacred cup for your determination and persistence by cleverness and skill but beware the power of the grail itself will pass a final judgment upon your worthiness to possess it so all the actions that we've done, we have to see if we're going to be worthy of the grail. So count the place of the pillar until you reach my sacred number, which is six. I believe if I remember correctly, beneath that pillar, you will find what you seek. And so the thing on the thing about the counterclockwise and all that stuff should be a hint. But then you have to realize where's the top and how do you count it? So. about the grail he says you know just follow the instructions you were just given thanks Merlin you're a tremendous help glad you're there to help me out buddy looking in the book to basically see about the swirl so that appears to be an exit out of the arena so first we have to find the grail and you can see the circle indent so you can see one two and then there's that fallen one but there's that blank space that is right above where King Arthur is so that'd be three four and then five six so 
So we must find the right one by our wits. And they all look the same. So the swirl, so six is the number, the swirl's counterclockwise. So we can try to push it, but then nothing happens because we're at the wrong one. So we'll counterclockwise from over here, starting at one, two, And you can see that I realized that counterclockwise is the other way, and I'm an idiot for counting clockwise. So it's hard to tell if that one standing is three. We'll go with that. So there's four right there. That one would be five. So the next one ideally should be six. As we give a push, and guess what? It moves. And you found it. You have found the grail. The game is over, but not quite. Because someone we've met before is about to come back into the picture. And he was, he was seen ever so briefly. So it's not the guy for the desert, but someone else. And once we, our hand barely touches it, a white cloth covers it, the Grail's power pours through you and restores you instantly to perfect health. So the rat poison is no longer taking effect. The Grail has cured us and seen us to be worthy of possessing the Grail. So the It's Just a Model is a reference to Mighty Python. And lo and behold, there's a thief that struck us earlier. This time we are going to chase him. And we can guess he's going to go down that stairway because that seems to be the exit. And what's cool is when we get there, you know what, I'll save it. So we're going to chase him down the alley. He's going to make that turn. We're going to keep chasing him. By the all gods, he will escape. But no, he jumps on the rope and it breaks. Your god smiles upon you. Mercy, master, mercy. I'm only a poor, miserable wretch. Have mercy, I beg you, have mercy. Here is your treasure untouched. He is a pathetic creature. You must choose, Arthur. Either take up the grail now, in an act of mercy, or kill him. So we actually have a choice. So we're going to do both. We're going to save. First, we're going to kill him. So we kill the thief, and I don't ban you for slaying him after all the grief he has caused you. The merchants of Jerusalem will thank you. At least the grail is unharmed. Now you must move quickly and find the way out. So we've killed him. We saved here, so we'll restore and do the same thing. And there's Galahad, who is in perfect health. My king, you've won the grail. Oh, yeah. So we put it on that altar, and it burns away the other cod. Behold. Mithra has been driven away, and the grail is gone. So now it is only Christ, and everything looks great and fancy. The light of the grail shines bright. The land is restored. Everything looks good. We have clean water. The storms go away. The wind is gently blowing the flags. Camelot is healed.
So things seem to be going well. Everyone's cheering. The three knights that you rescued are present. And there's Merlin with his little mystical mug and mystical happenings. Talking how we won through purity even though we did kill that thief. With peace and prosperity returned to your kingdom, you have the time to rest and enjoy the land you have saved. Hooray. And there we go. But though your land is healed, your heart is not. Perhaps it never shall be. As we see our queen, our beloved wife, with Lancelot speaking by the fountain with the roses. And again, I really like that we have a more complex kind of story happening here. That even in the end, even though King Arthur has saved the kingdom and everything is great, it still was not enough to win the queen's love. Because her heart was in Lancelot's. And it's kind of funny that I'm talking about this today because right now, as of it's 11:15, so it's 11:15 p.m., so it's still technically Valentine's Day right now. It's actually February 14th as we're wrapping this up, and so we see the ending. Uh, and it looks like there is no consequence for killing the thief, which I thought, um, since you're kind of giving the player a choice to spare the um, spare the thief or kill him now I imagine it probably re reflects on your score but I would have liked to have seen perhaps Merlin say something that though you've won perhaps you could have shown mercy to those you know less fortunate because I'm sure the thief does not want to be a thief he is he is a thief because of circumstance you know and so it would have been kind of cool if Merlin kind of gave a little jab to say eh maybe you could have been a little nicer to that thief so we're going to see this ending play out um, and then we're going to restore back and then we're going to spare the thief and uh, just so you know the ending is exactly the same what we just saw is the same exact ending camelot is saved merlin says you did great and still it's not enough for your love so there's our score 325 out of 368 261 out of 293 and 345 out of 358 and so now we're going to spare the thief. We're going to take the grail. And so he tries to stab us by the gods. He dared try to stab you in the back. If not for your male tunic, you would be dead. It's time to let the grail decide. So we hold out the grail. And uh, it actually goes pretty bad for the uh, thief as the grail turns to judge him for his actions and flails his flesh and so he becomes the end he deserves <laughs> so yes he did try to stab us in the back uh, but arthur would not have known that um, when he kills him first so the grail harshly judges this thief and so now we have to move quickly to go find galahad and then the rest as i said is pretty much the same but you must wonder what did this thief do in his life that the grail judged him so harshly to incinerate his flesh and leave only skeleton behind so that is a pretty harsh judgment uh he must have done much worse than thievery and obviously murder was not behind him or beyond him because he did try to stab king arthur in the back um, when King Arthur turned his back. So this dude has probably committed murder, to be fair, and that is probably what the Grail has judged. Not only his attempt to kill King Arthur, but he has probably murdered people in the past. I love that I'm making the backstory for this thief, who I first said, like, had an unfortunate life. He didn't want to be a thief. He's probably also a murderer. <laughs> and as you can see, the Grail lights up, just like before, and Camelot will be saved. And so... That wraps up this playthrough of Conquest of Camelot. 
I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you have by now clicked like and subscribe. If you have enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy the commentary, but you enjoyed the other videos or whatever, um, I would love if you would click like and subscribe. I am trying to reach a thousand subscribers so that way I can monetize the channel. And in an effort, you know, again, I probably won't make much because if I reach a thousand subscribers, it's not like I have millions, but I can keep trying to work, uh, work upward and try to get more out of it. Um, but yeah, if I can monetize this as well as, you know, just enjoy playing Sierra games, that would be incredible. So please like and subscribe. Please tell your friends to like and subscribe if you have social media. By all means, please help share the word. I would truly, truly appreciate it. And uh, coming up next will probably be Conquest of Longbow, because that makes sense. Um, there is another game I may play uh, in before Conquest of Longbow, and it's a it's not a Sierra game. There was a game that uh, my friend Chuck and I played. This was way back in the day on his computer. Um, I want to say it's like called Nocturnus or something like that. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. I want to say it's Nocturne. Oh, Noctropolis. So, yeah, Noctropolis. It's basically like a crime drama, but in a comic book format. Um, came out late 80s early 90s um because it was on my like like i said my friend chuck got it and we played it i don't know if we ever finished it so i'm kind of curious to actually play it again it was it actually showed up on gog where i grabbed it once i saw it and i was totally stoked to see it so i may play that before conquest of longbow or i might do conquest of longbow and then play that i haven't decided yet i've already got conquest of longbow configured and set up to run on my machine so i may do that because i don't think i have Noctropolis set up on this machine that I normally play on. All right, listen, I'm going to stop rambling. Again, please like and subscribe. Please pass the word. Love you all. Bye.